So guys, welcome back to our channel. So in this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto had what if Naruto was neglected by family trained by Zabuzel. This is movie 1, and if you want more then please leave a like share and subscribe, let's get in the video. The night of October 10th, a disaster had befallen Kanahagakur. Unaware and unprepared the village was attacked by the bitch known as the Kikbi, known also as the Nine-Tailed Fox. While many shinobi and kinoichi were putting their lives on the line to defend their home, panic was spreading throughout the ranks as the absence of their leader the Yandame Hokage. Meanwhile, in a chamber hidden away within the Hokage monument, Minato Namikaze was in the process of helping his wife with her delivery of their children. Minato was in a panic, hearing the sound of his village being destroyed and feeling the Kikba's violent attacks throughout the chamber was worrying the young cage. Weeks ago, Minato had delved into figuring out a way to subdue or destroy the bitch without endangering his wife. From past reports that he had studied and reviewed, a Jinch Kriki was most vulnerable when giving birth. Though, in the end Minato wasn't successful in finding a solution that he liked. Sealing the beast was the only solution that he had been able to come up with, though the price of sealing the beast was condemning himself and the beast to the Shinigami and his children, to carrying such a terrible burden. However, fate had decided otherwise. Your lucky mortal. Contracting me using the Shaikif Jin requires that you forfeit your soul and by extension, your life once the sealing is completed. However, removing you from this plane when your family still requires you, you who gave life to the one chosen. For this, I will pardon the requirement of taking your soul, but I will take something dear to not only you, but those who are precious to you as compensation. Do not forget this mortal, the Shinigami ominously said, sealing the soul, yin and yang chakra of the Kikbi into three of his four children, Narumi, Mido, and Menma respectively. After the sealing and confrontation with the Shinigami was over, the threat of the Kikbi adverted, Kanoha shifted its attention to treating those injured from the event and to rebuild what was lost. Scene change Kanoha Hospital, everyone had better not be slacking. If I even think that you are not giving it your all, it'll drive you through the wall. Roared a beautiful blonde woman with her hair tied in two tails, that woman being one of the Densetsu no Sanin, Tsunade Senju, as she stormed into the hospital after checking on the Yuzumaki Namika's family. Glancing around and noticing the lack of attention directed at her due to the crazy atmosphere, Tsunade decided to ask her right-hand woman, assistant, and disciple, what's the situation looking like so far Shizun? Roared Tsunade not seeing her anywhere. Tsunade Sama. The injured have been reduced by half thanks to the field staff dealing with situations outside of the hospital that we weren't severe enough to warrant admission. From the number of patients and medics, it estimate that we're almost finished treating the ones who have been admitted, and I haven't seen more than seven patients be admitted in the past hour. I think that most of the shinobi and villagers who were injured have been taken care of. Replied a pretty yet exhausted woman with shoulder-length raven hair, Shizun, Tsunade's assistant and disciple. Releasing a relieved sigh, Tsunade voiced her relief with the now stable situation at hand. Wuyu, that's good. I had imagined that there would have been many more injured than that, thank goodness. That means that all the injured are accounted for, meaning that the village got out in extremely good shape when you compare it to other villages who were attacked by Bijk. Also sharing a sigh of relief with her mentor, Shizun remembered the two who were in the middle of the attack. Tsunade Sama. You said that all the injured were accounted for right, what about Kishina Sama and Minato Sama? Shouted a worried Shizun, having momentarily forgotten about her village's leader and his wife. Relax Shizun, they're safe. Minato had a rather severe case of chakra exhaustion, but hell be alright knowing him. Kishina, other than the typical signs of giving birth, is completely fine. Even after having the kick be forced out of her, she's still alive and is going to be fine. She'll be up and about in no more than five hours tops, he'll even make a bet that she will. Tsunade confidently replied, so confident that she offered to make a bet with Shizun on it, which given her alias as the legendary sucker was no small statement. The two shared a relieved and happy laugh as the danger that, no more than 48 hours before, had passed. That is, until Tsunade had assumed that Shizun was also laughing at her extremely bad luck and chased her around the hospital wing, her fist waving threateningly in the air, while the other occupants and staff of the hospital laughed in good humor at the antics of the duo. Scene change Yuzumaki Namika's estate. Minato, are you sure that you're alright? You used the Shaikif Jin, but you didn't lose your soul like what was supposed to happen. A tall man, with a spiky mane of white hair with red paint on his face, worriedly asked his disciple, this man was Jiraiya, one of the Densetsu no Sanin and mentor to Minato. Sensei, I told you I'm fine. See, I can do everything without a problem. I need to go see Kushi-chan and my kids, so please stop worrying about me. Minato replied, creating his fabled Rasengan to emphasize his point to his mentor. With a sign, Jiraiya relented, patting his student on the shoulder, he congratulated him on his defeat of the Kikbi and of the beginning of his family. I am proud of you Minato, you have come so far even without my help. I couldn't have asked for a better student. 
Jiraiya said, pride evident in his voice as he walked with Minato towards the room created specifically for his children. Walking in quietly, they found what they were looking for. Kashina with her arms full with her, no their children. Wordlessly walking towards her and sitting down, he wrapped her and their children in a loving embrace. Their beautiful Kushi-chan. Minato said, resting his head on his wife's. Sinking into her husband's embrace, Kashina sniffled a bit before expressing her sincere thanks to whatever entity that allowed her family to stay together, though what seemed like impossible odds. Nina-kun, we're together. We're all together. All of us. You didn't have your soul taken, and I survived having the kick force out. We're going to be able to watch our children grow up and they'll have a family to love and take care of them. Kashina whispered as she sobbed quietly while shaking a little, the all too real possibility that she cold lost her husband and her life, leaving her children alone in the world, with no one to care for them taking its toll on her. Nuzzling his wife and holding her closer, Minato reassured her that nothing would ever threaten to tear about their family again. All through the night, parents and children stayed together until sleep took them as the mental and emotional exhaustion that the two had accumulated had finally reached its peak. As the night continued on, the oldest born of the quadruplets woke, quietly observing his surroundings, finally focusing his attention towards the ceiling as a voice make its way to his ears. Child. Child you can hear me, can you not? I am the one who allowed your father to survive his contract with me, the price of his soul replaced with something that will greatly affect you. As the oldest of four, the child of prophecy, and the child who will change the world, you will be without the love of the ones who should hold you close. That is the exchange that I had made in place of your father's soul. You who will be without love will be the one who will defy all obstacles which will stand before you. Do not fret child, as you will forge a path that will change the world, and remember this, do not give in to the hate that will undoubtedly plague your heart in the future to come. The bone-chilling voice echoed within his mind, completely unaware of his future, the child slowly looked around the room before returning to sleep, the echoes of that voice repeating quieter each time. Scene change Kanahagakur. Seven years after Kikbi attack, in the private training ground of the Yuzumaki Namika's estate, five individuals were engaged with training. A boy with shaggy blonde hair with brilliant red tinted tips with deep cerulean blue eyes, standing at around four feet high, this was Menma Yuzumaki Namika's, third born of the Yuzumaki Namika's family, who was chasing around his father Minato, as the two were laughing loudly. The other two children consisted of two girls of the same height of four feet, giggling and chatting happily with their mother Kashina, second born of the family was Mito Yuzumaki Namikas, who had her mother's brilliant red hair that went to the mid of her back tied into a ponytail, and her father's cerulean blue eyes. The other was the youngest of the Yuzumaki Namikas family, Narumi Yuzumaki Namikas, who had inherited her father's blonde hair that was tied in a twin tails fashion, with bangs similar to her father framing her face, and her mother's violet-colored eyes. The scene now was a picturesque moment of a happy family spending time together, which would have been true if not for the pair of navy blue eyes, watching his family partake in another activity without him. He was the oldest of the Yuzumaki Namika's children, he was Naruto Yuzumaki Namika's, having a darker shade of blonde and darker colored eyes than his family. After heaving a sigh, he returned to his room to finish his book, momentarily forgotten for the slim chance that he would be invited to play with his family. After reaching his room, he sat back down on the bed and continued where he left off, he drifted off to the world that the book offered for him, as he contemplated his interactions with his family over the years. It's not going to change it is. It's been this way for as long as I can remember, and I still don't know why they always leave me out when we do things. Ach-an and Tu-san didn't used to be like this, they used to include me in things when I was younger, I just know it unknown to Naruto, and his family was the contract that the Shinigami made all those years ago with Minato. Instead of his soul he took the away the feelings of love that Minato, Kishina, and those who were close to the Yuzumaki Namikas had for Naruto, a twisted exchange that severed the bonds that he had with his parents and siblings, and by extension, those associated with them. Though his parents did not neglect in terms of shelter, he had to learn to make his own meals and shop for clothes on his own. They did severely neglect him when it came to love. He was forgotten and rejected in favor of his more vocal siblings, Menma in particular, ensured his parents pay no attention to himself by being more assertive and vocal with his demands, like when it came to where the family was to go eat and the like. This divide was not limited to Menma, Narumi and Mito both stayed a distance away from their older brother like he was an outsider, even though in the past they used to play together like normal siblings, however that ceased happening years ago, as Narumi began to act similar to Menma, and Mito closed him off from any form of contact with her. From the situations that has been in up to this point, he didn't think like it would be ending anytime soon. Letting his head fall onto his pillow, Naruto could only think about what his future would hold. He would rather be hated than completely ignored, but it seemed to the young boy that that was an impossibility. However, he would be starting his ninja training at the academy in the fall, so for now the future seemed brighter than it did in the past year. 
Time skipped three years later. Ha Chan. Tu San. Can't we learn any cool jutsu yet? Menma complained as he was balancing a leaf on his forehead little success. His mind set on learning something cooler like his father's Rasengan then something as boring improving his chakra control. Memnon I, you need to learn to focus more if you want to be a super cool ninja like Kachan and Tusan, right Tusan. Narumi half lectured her brother and half asked her father as she was participating in the same exercise that her brother and sister. Sitting next to Narumi was Mido, trying to concentrate on her own leaf through the ruckus that her younger siblings were causing, if the tick marks that were starting to become visible were any indicator. Menma, Narumi, could you two please quiet down? I'm having trouble concentrating since you two are being so loud. Mido finally said, releasing her niece and aura as Minato and Kashina called it. But undeterred by their sister's aura, the two started to argue as to who was better at balancing their leaf, as her older sister sighed at the impatience of sibling. Laughing with his wife, Minato reassured the three that they would be learning something new soon, as soon as they gain a better grip on their chakra control. Volkashina listed off the reasons as to why they needed to polish up their chakra control, or else they'd be just like her when she was a genin, a chakra powerhouse without any efficient way to use any of it, which seemed to have worked as the Mido started to work harder as her younger siblings quieted down and started to concentrate seriously with nervous expressions on their faces. As their children quieted down and started taking their training seriously, Minato and Kashina let their thoughts flow around the chaotic events that have occurred in the past couple of years. Kumo's failed kidnapping attempt on their family friend Hiyashi Hayuga's daughter, Hinata. Luckily Minato was on his way to the Inuzuka compound that night to pick drop off Menma when he spotted the Kumo nin carrying a sack and running. Naturally his response was to put Menma down and chase down the shinobi and apprehend him. Apparently he was a part of a splinter group made of Kumo nin, who were remnants of a radical group back in the time of the Third Shinobi World War, who desperately wanted the Byakugan. Then there was the failed coup d'etat orchestrated by Ichiha under the same masked ninja behind the Kaibas attack all those years ago. From the reports after the incident, those involved were under a particularly powerful Jinjutsu, warping their perceptions on the world and the things around them. Thanks to Kishina, Minato, Fugaku, Mikoto, and their oldest son Itachi, things were settled with a few injured being the only casualties of the incident due to Minato and Kishina sealing the movements of the involved and to Fugaku, Mikoto and Itachi using their Sharingan to disrupt the Jinjutsu. Finally their thoughts drifted back to their family, namely to their oldest, who wasn't taking part in training with his sibling. Mixed emotions were swirling within the two as they recounted their past interactions or lack of interaction with him. Confusion and despair began to fill their hearts as the reason as to why they were so distant to their oldest son eluded them, no matter how much they tried to remember. What happened? What? Why can't I find a reason why I've been ignoring him and leaving him behind? Agitated and confused, Minato mulled over the reason of his neglectful behavior towards his son. I. I want to be close to Naruto, but for some reason I can't open my heart to him, and I can't help but feel as though that would put Mido, Menma, and Narumi in danger. Why? Why is that? While her husband was beginning to question if he was being paranoid or not, Kishina began to think of her oldest as well. I've failed as a mother to Neruchan Haven I, I, I just can't open my heart to him for some reason. Whenever I try to get back into his life, it feels like something dark and cold enters my heart and I end up chickening out. What happened? Bishina began to feel as if a curse was placed on her to never love her oldest son, which was closer to the truth than she knew, though the truth won't be known to her and her husband for a number of years. However, their thoughts were broken by a rather upset-looking Narumi. Tusan. Kachan. Menmanai is being mean and cheating. He said that his leaf was balanced and when I looked he blew mine off my hand. Then he said that he won because of that. Tearfully complained Narumi holding her leaf in one hand while flailing her other arm in a comical fashion as Menma quickly defended himself. I did not. Narumi is making things up again too san. Kachan. Ask Mido ni. Shall tell you that I didn't do any of that. Right Mido ni. I did balance my leaf and when I told Narumi the wind just happened to blow right at that moment and it was while I was telling her so it looked like I blew her leaf off her hand which I didn't do. Menma said in his defense, looking tearfully at his older sister for her support in his claim. However, that was not to be this time around. Dusan, Kachan. Menma did it. You know how he gets when Thiras has in a contest, he'll do anything to win. Narumi was almost able to balance her leaf when Menma did that so he could win. Mido said, petting her sister on her head as Menma dropped his in defeat and embarrassment. Defeat because he knew he had lost the argument and embarrassment because he knew he would be getting a lecture from his father and mother. Sighing to themselves, Kishina and Minato looked at each other before bursting out into laughter at the antics of their children. Seeing their parents laughing, Mido, Menma, and Narumi cold help but start laughing and giggling along with them. 
though they were laughing together at the moment, Minato and Kashina couldn't help but feel guilty that there was a member of their family that had been forgotten and neglected. Scene change unknown forest, unknown location. On the other side of the village, there was a boy no older than 10 years old, working on his own exercises under the supervision of an individual who looked no older than 20 years old. Haha ha, how was that sensei? Asked the boy, wiping the sweat on his forehead off with a towel handed to him by his sensei. Well what can I say you are doing great Naruto. However, you are still stiff in some of your movements. You know that to use my style of tojutsu you need to have power, fluidity, and speed. But don't worry too much about it alright. You are only 10 years old remember. Naruto sensei replied in a laid back tone of voice. He stood at roughly 6 feet tall, having a muscular yet lithe build with short raven colored hair spiked up slightly with a stray stand hanging off of on the side in, and electric blue eyes that held a twinkle of mischief. Though, instead of round pupils his looked reptilian in nature. This young man was a memory from the last shinobi world war, working as a shinobi for the village hidden under the sun, Tengakure, that wished to remain neutral from the chaos that consumed the land, having no real military force due to being a rich agricultural village. Known during the war as Heaven's Catastrophe due to his unnatural and terrifying mastery and control over wind, fire, and lightning. Ryuhei Shuriken had succeeded in his mission to protect Tengakure, inadvertently securing his title and page in the bingo books of various hidden villages due to decimating numerous parties that were attempting to take over Tengakure. Though, only a few survivors were able to make it back to their respective main forces and recall what they had faced. From the reports, it appeared that they had faced a demon in a man's body. Though the correct way to say it would be a dragon in a man's body. Born the only son of Tetsuya Shuriken and Aan Hatenko, Ryuhei was trained in Tejutsu by his mother and Kenjutsu by his father. Learning Ninjutsu and Jinjutsu from both of his parents, and later signing his family's private summoning contract which required finding a partner that matched his own style and personality. Eventually, his parents passed away by a disease that, from what his mother had told him, plagued their family for generations as a side effect from training alongside their partners, Ryuhei eventually contracting the same dragon virus that his parents had passed away from. Na, sensei could I ask you something kind of personal? It's okay if you don't answer me though. Naruto timidly asked, slowly turning towards Ryuhei with a somewhat bashful expression on his face. Ah, uh -huh, no need to be shy Naruto. I'm your sensei, you can tell me and ask me anything unless it's about women. I have no idea what goes on inside of their heads, and from what I've seen and heard, it's really kind of scary. Ryuhei happily replied, though towards the end of his statement, he made a mortified face from admitting his lack of knowledge concerning women to his young student. First making an embarrassed face, Naruto's face quickly turned a little serious, with a hint of anger seeping in at his sensei's nonsensical reply concerning him asking about something personal. Sensei. I don't want to know any of that. And I don't care about that. I want to know why you won't go see someone so they can help cure you. Naruto barked out, finally having had enough of his sensei not taking his disease seriously after knowing about for so long. Wiping the mortified look off his face, Ryuhei's expression changed from surprised to solemn. Ah, that's what you wanted to ask about, eh? I remember telling you that I won't be able to be your sensei for very long when I started training you three years ago, guess you won't have forgotten about that, huh? Well, Naruto, do you really want to know the reason why I don't take my disease seriously? Looking at his student straight in the eyes and asking his question, he saw his student flinch before he nodded his head slowly. Letting a smile come to his face, Ryuhei walked up to his precious student, put his hand on his head, and ruffled his hair, Naruto bowing his head slightly, while his cheeks flushed pink in embarrassment and happiness. Well Naruto, the reason is because I'm going to die no matter what happens, so why bother you know? After hearing his sensei's reply, Naruto's head snapped immediately up, staring at his sensei with disbelief in his eyes. From disbelief, Naruto's eyes quickly shifted to anger and confusion. After removing his sensei's hand by grabbing his wrist, Naruto glared at him before yelling at the his sensei. What do you mean why bother? You're going to die Ryu sensei. Don't act like you can't do something to cure yourself. You need to find a cure sensei. After venting his anger at his sensei's dismissal of his disease, Naruto began to tear up and started sniffling slightly, whispering something that spoke volumes about the feelings in his heart. You can't die Ryu Naichin. You can't leave me alone. I don't want to be alone again. I hate being alone. After speaking from his heart, Naruto was crying and sniffling at the thought of being alone in the world again. Ryuhei was the one who talked, played, praised, lectured, and trained him. He was the father figure that he had always wanted, and now Ryuhei could be at the Shinigamis door at any moment. The very thought of losing him terrified Naruto to no end. Smiling solemnly and once again putting his hand on his students he ruffled his hair gently. Naruto you remember what I said all those years ago when I met you for the first time. Flashback. 
scene change unknown lake, sitting on the shoreline of a small lake, boy around seven years old was skipping rocks alone. His dark blonde hair blowing gently by the breeze, his navy blue eyes filled with sadness and were red and puffy from crying, the tear streaks fresh on his face. His eyes were unfocused, indicating that his mind was somewhere else. Because of that, he didn't take notice of the person who had taken a seat right next to him until he saw another rock that didn't belong to him skip across the surface of the lake. Turning his head, he saw a large person wearing a tattered black cloak, though he was afraid at first he became terrified once the cloaked individual turned to face him and he saw their electric blue eyes staring into his navy blue ones. Though, that fear vanished once they turned away and skipped another rock. Confusion replaced fear and timidly Naruto gathered the necessary courage to ask the stranger for an introduction. UMH hello W who are why you? Naruto managed to squeak out, stuttering a bit as the fear returned. Turning back to face him, the stranger did something that Naruto did not expect. They, or rather he laughed, judging from how deep the voice sounded. Haha, I was wondering when you'd do something. Though I was expecting the old scream and run routine that most kids do when facing a stranger, especially if that stranger is as scary as people say I am. Laughing after his answer, he pulled back the hood of his cloak to reveal a youthful face and an energetic smile to the boy, who in response smiled back albeit shyly. The name's Ryu Hei Shuriken, but just call me Ryu. What's your name? The energetic smile on Ryuhei's face grew into a grin, and finally introducing himself he asked for Naruto's in return. Smiling back a little more, Naruto introduced himself, and the two started talking and asking things about each other. After hearing about Naruto's past and his relationship with his family, Ryuhei's expression darkened as he told Naruto what was on his mind. Ah, I see. Your family isn't really treating you like family, huh? Well, you know what it'd say to that Naruto. It'd say that if they're not treating you like family, like they're supposed to, then forget about them. Ryuhei angrily said, rage burning in his eyes. Naturally, Naruto was taken by and frightened by his expression. From a nice and fun person to a person with a scary look in his eyes, Ryuhei's drastic 180 caused Naruto to flinch slightly, but he still managed to stutter out a reply. B but they're my family right? They're supposed to uh, love me and see care for me. Ryuhei quickly lost his angry look as he sighed, looking at Naruto again, his eyes were sober which again surprised Naruto. If they were family Naruto, you won't be asking me that question you know. Family is supposed to love you unconditionally and care for you without having to be asked to. From what Yav told me, they aren't your family. They're just people who share the same blood as you, that alone does not define family you know. Ryuhei said, reaching out and ruffling Naruto's hair softly. After Ryuhei started ruffling his hair, Naruto, who has never experienced such a gesture, could only lean his head on Ryuhei's hand. Sniffling slightly, he timidly asked something that would change his life. Then I'm alone. I've always been alone. So am I going to be alone forever then Ryu? Looking up with teary eyes, Naruto found Ryuhei giving him a warm smile filled and eyes filled with what he saw in his parents whenever his siblings were with him, love and compassion. There's no way you're alone you know. I'm right here. I've never been able to have siblings or am I ever going to have children you know. If people found out about their connection to heaven's catastrophe they'd be hunted down for the rest of their lives just for being related to me. But, I'll ask you Naruto and you don't have to agree or answer me, but how about becoming my little brother? Asked Ryuhei almost bashfully if the light dusting of pink on his cheeks were any indication. Snapping his head up, Naruto looked at Ryuhei with almost comical disbelief in his eyes, but more than that, they were also filled with hope. Hope that what Ryuhei was saying wasn't a twisted lie, but an actual offer of becoming a part of the family. Launching himself at the young man, Naruto wrapped his arms around Ryuhei and buried his face in his chest. Will really let me be your little brother? Are going to be my older brother but not care for me and leave me behind? Naruto mumbled with doubt heavy in him trembling voice before asking something that made Ryuhei flinch slightly but quickly recover. Will you always be with me and look out for me? Ryu Naichin. Slowly wrapping his arms around Naruto, Ryuhei brought a hand up to ruffle Naruto's hair gently. If you are going to ask me like that how can I say no? Tightening his embrace on his new Itado, little brother, slightly, he replied in a gently voice that soothed all doubts that Naruto had about his new Aniki. No matter what, I'll always be here for you Naruto. Even if I'm not here physically, I'll always be with you in your heart, as long as you don't forget about me. Sniffling a little bit before he raised his head, Naruto, for the first time in a number of years, finally revealed a heart-melting smile. Thank you Ryu Naichin. Thank you for wanting someone like me. After seeing his Itado smile, Ryuhei could only smile back in return before hugging Naruto again. And thank you Naruto, for wanting to be a part of my family. I'll always be watching you and I'll do my best to make you happy and protect you. I promise. After which Naruto looked up and through teary yet happy eyes, he replied with a smile so bright the sun looked dull in comparison. 
you already have, Ryu Naichin. Flashback end, sniffling and nodding his head, Naruto looked up at Ryuhei and repeated the words that he told him all those years ago, after they made their bond as brothers. You said that Yao'll always be watching over me and that Yao'll always try to protect and make me happy. After repeating his older brother's words, Naruto received another round of head ruffling from Ryuhei. That's right, so don't be sad all right. It'll always be in your heart as long as you never forget about me and the times where we laughed, cried, and enjoyed with each other all right. And here, I have something for you. An anniversary present, it's been three years since we made that promise to each other, remember? Ryuhei said in a happy tone, handing Naruto a simple black and white scroll. Looking at his bother then reaching timidly for the scroll, Naruto looked at it before voicing his curiosity. Ryu Nai, what's in here? It looks like a normal scroll, is it another scroll for history or training exercises? Yeah, that scroll contains everything that I've collected over the years, including my family's scrolls, various weapons including my personal ones, and other things that y'all have to find out yourself. Before giving his brother a smile and patting him on the head. But hey, we'll save that for next time alright. Get home and well pick it up next time alright. Wiping the rest of his tears away, Naruto returned his brother's smile before giving him a hug which was returned tenfold. As he headed home for the night, Naruto felt something inside of his heart nagging at him to stay with his brother, no matter what he said, but he figured it was because of the talk they had earlier. His brother would never leave him, especially after the talk of him possibly dying, right? The next day, Ryuhei never showed up. Within the void of the spiritual plane, two beings of immeasurable power were discussing a topic brought up after ten years of waiting. The first resembled a tall, fit, sickly-looking yet handsome man with snow-white hair. In contrast to his appearance from ten years ago, he bore more resemblance to a human than the deity that most see him as. This being was known as Shinigami, the one who reigns over those who have died, leading them towards their respective paths in the afterlife. The second was a beautiful, curvaceous woman with long hair as black as the night sky. She was known as the goddess of creation and life, resembling what most would think the giver of life would look like. In contrast to their status as deities, they were acting rather human when comparing what they were doing now to what their godly duties were. Shinigami was prostrating in front of his younger sister, Imado, while crying comically as he begged for mercy. Standing tall in front of him with her foot tapping and eyebrow twitching in irritation was a very, very angry Kami. Shinigami swore he could see himself behind her with pitying eyes directed towards himself as he would definitely be going to the after she was done with him. Well? What do you have to say for yourself, eh, Naikai? Kami spoke in a syrup-sweet sing-song tone of voice, a demonic smile on her face with her eyes closed, her brows still twitching in irritation. After hearing about his master plan to remove the child of prophecy from earthly attachments in order to prevent one side from gaining the upper hand due to winning over his heart. However, he removed the attachments that were supposed to reside within her jurisdiction, he dealt with those who were dead and needed to pass over to the after not those who were still living. I'm sorry Kami-chan. I was just trying to ensure that the state of the physical world stayed in balance. I wasn't thinking straight. Having to deal with souls and the birth of the child of prophecy was stressful, and I didn't want to have to deal with more souls later on if one side gained the advantage. Forgive me. Please. Begging his Amado for any mercy on his soul, Shinigami pleaded giving his reasons for usurping his control over an issue that belonged to his Amado's domain. Sighing, Kami stopped her foot from tapping and her brow from twitching. Running her hands down her face, she could only groan at the complications that her idiotic Aniki caused. Not only did he interfere with the living, he probably ruined the family because he wanted to skimp out on work in the future. Opening her eyes and revealing her striking emerald green eyes, she glared at her brother. You idiot. Do you know how much you messed up you could have destroyed a family because of your laziness? You're such an idiot. Why do I have to deal with such a lazy, inconsiderate, sloppy, dumb brother like you? Kami roared, grabbing Shinigami by the collar of his kimono and shaking him violently while angrily lecturing him about his use of shortcuts to cut his time dealing with work down. After she finished lecturing her brother, she dropped him, panting trying to catch her breath after her angry lecture. Laying on the ground with his normally onyx eyes replaced with swirls, Shinigami could only thank whatever other god had saved him from his Amado's wrath. After regaining his conciseness and composure, he explained the situation with the child of prophecy to his sister, along with what has happened in his life. Naturally, he was beaten badly due to his regenerative abilities tied to his status as a god, his Amado doesn't hold back. After his beating his sister looked at him, her eyes still angry but now serious. Seeing the look in his sister's eyes, Shinigami quickly became serious as well. Aniki, how do you know that one side won't gain the advantage? From your reports, he doesn't care for his family anymore and by extension the village that they is in due to their neglect and ignorance of his existence. What's to say that we won't turn on them if another villager power tempts him with the offer of power, wealth, or family? 
the child is incapable of thinking rationally with their mind as most of their logic and reason stems from their emotions. He could be unstable and that could cause an imbalance, you know that just because you can observe him doesn't mean you know the inner workings of his psyche. Kami stated, not trusting that her brother knew what he was doing or even what he was thinking. Removing the love of the family was a twisted act in of itself, but then removing the hope of ever feeling love from the place that was growing up in, that was the most twisted thing that her brother had ever done. Looking his sister right in her eyes, Shinigami didn't flinch like he normally would from her glare. Kami-chan. I know that I've made a lot of mistakes in the eternity that we've known each other, and I do mean a lot of mistakes. But this isn't a mistake. I know that I removed the feelings of love from that child's family and village, and I know that what you're telling me is true. But what I haven't told you yet are the final pieces of information from my report regarding the one who has taken that child under his wing. At the end of that statement, Kami lost her glare as her eyes widened by minute amount. What? Don't tell me that a single person has secured the loyalty of the child of prophecy for themselves, Kami shouted, fearing for the state of the physical plane, if a corrupted individual had managed to place the child of prophecy under their control. But her concerns were lost as her brother shook his head with a small smile, gracing his features. No need to be concerned my dear Amato, the one who secured possibly the only position within that child's heart is passed on. At his statement, Kami's eyes widened considerably. Concern and fear evident in her voice, Kami couldn't help but shout her question at her brother. Don't tell me that Hess unstable now. There is no way that a child would remain sane having the only source of love ripped from them. But again, she was met with the same smile as before. Like I was saying before you rudely interrupted me Kami-chan, Kami had the decency to blush at her actions. The one who has shown that child love also made it known that he would be passing on into the after well before his time came. That act alone will most likely cement the fact that the child of prophecy will remain neutral in the physical plane. Though his heart will be frozen over he will not vent his anger and hate on the world, he was raised by one of the shuriken after all, and you know that they were ones who always managed to steal their hearts in times of great pain and hate. He will undoubtedly carry on that ideal, as from what I have seen, he cared a great deal about that person. Now, I will be slowly removing the curse, which in three years' time will be completely lifted, at which the village's genin exam will commence. By doing that, it will ensure that he will form no permanent bonds with anyone within the village, and that his bond to the one who showed him love cements itself within his heart that will secure his neutrality within the physical plane. Looking slightly confused, Kami decided voice her confusion as she didn't understand why he would remain neutral after all that will possibly happen in the future. Wait, Aniki, why would he remain neutral? Won't people ignoring him after Hess experienced love make him hate them more? Especially if his family continues to love each other and continues to leave him on the side, or if his siblings or others harass and antagonize him due to him being a social outcast of the village. But once again, her brother reassured her with a smile. Don't worry Kami-chan. He won't give in to that hate, he was raised by his brother to be have a strong and sturdy heart that can endure than a weak one which would give in to the hate. I assure you on my status as the one who reigns over death and as your older brother that he will not give in to the hate that the physical plane has. Trust your Aniki once in a while alright. Shinigami confidently said, looking at his sister with confidence radiating in his eyes. Her brother's confidence eventually won her over as she accepted his plan. Alright Aniki, he'll trust you. Just don't do this kind of thing ever again without consulting me first okay. Kami bashfully told her brother. Tuckling, he wrapped his arm around his sister's neck and pulled her in ruffling her hair as Kami turning bright red with a sudden show of affection. However her blissful moment of bonding with her brother was ruined. Nah, Kami-chan. Why are you so red? Don't tell me that you're getting sick gods can't get sick can we? Her eyebrow started to twitch as her brother immediately started freaking out about gods catching mortal illnesses until she finally snapped. Flushing red with anger, Kami kicked her brother where the spiritual sun don't shine, then she huffed and walked away as her brother collapsed to the ground writhing in agony clutching his blessings. HMPH, males are all stupid human or god baka and Nikki Kami angrily said the first part but mumbled the last part, her face still slightly red with anger and embarrassment. Time skip three years later, scene change Kanoha Academy, Kanoha's Academy, a place for children to prepare for a career of being a shinobi or kanoichi to protect and serve their village. In the classroom being headed by Chikninaruka Yamino and Mizuki were the next generation of potential ninja that would be united under the will of fire, and this particular class held the most notable students in the academy. Sitting in the front row was Menma Yuzumaki Namikas with his best friend Kiba Inuzuka, son of the Inuzuka clan head. Beside them were Menma's sisters, Nido and Narumi Yuzumaki Namikas with their best friends Yukumo Kurama and Hinata Hayuga. Next to them were the Achiha twin Sasuke and Satsuki, their usual scowls present. Behind them in the second row were best friends Shikamara Nara and Choji Akimichi, sons of the Nara and Akimichi clan heads respectively. 
Next to them sat Ino Yamanaka, daughter of the Yamanaka clan and Sakura Haruno, the daughter of a renowned civilian family, best friends and rivals in love for the affection of two most popular boys in the class. Finally in the last row of the room sat the quietest individuals of the class, Shino Aburam, son of the Aburam clan head. An aisle next to Shino sat Sai, a quiet and artistic individual with no known family. Lastly, next to the window in the back sat Naruto Uzumaki Namikas, the oldest of the Uzumaki Namikas siblings and the most distant. As Aruka and Mizuki called roll before getting ready for the genin exams, everyone quieted down, some nervous others excited for the exam to commence. The exam consisted of multiple parts, a written portion which covered basics in history and tactics. A physical portion which consisted of tojutsu sparring with an instructor and the use of kunai and shuriken. And lastly an injutsu portion which tested the proficiency of using the Academy 3 the three being Henj no Jutsu, Bunshin no Jutsu, and Kawarimi no Jutsu. All of which were needed to be used successfully in order for an Academy student to pass. However there was an extra credit or replacement opportunity in which if the student performed a jutsu outside of those three, which would replace the one that they had failed to do or add extra points to their exam, which could be the difference between becoming the rookie of the year. Seeing the looks of apprehension and excitement on his students' faces, Haruka couldn't help but smile and formally begin the exams. Alright, well I know a lot of you are nervous and excited, so let's begin. After which, they started calling students to test. Overall, all of the students of this class had passed with many exceeding the needed benchmark, which made Aruka a proud teacher. However, when it came to the oldest of the Uzumaki Namikas, he couldn't help but feel a little guilty having seen how far behind he was compared to his other students. He knew about the stigma that Naruto held, being the oldest child of the clan, yet being the weakest. Hiroka knew that he should tried to help his student more, but he called for some reason, he blamed it on the fact that it would probably be seen as favoritism, and he didn't want that, but looking back, it probably would been the right thing to do, despite what people would have said. Naruto was probably tied for dead last of the year, next to the children who weren't serious in becoming ninja. He managed to pass by the skin of his teeth on the written and physical exams, scoring usually one point over the failing threshold and landing his kunai and shuriken one over the needed amount to pass. Something about those results seemed strange to Aruka, but he brushed it off as mere coincidence. Snapping back to the present, Aruka found himself staring into the navy blue eyes of the very student he was thinking about. No matter how many times he saw it, the lack of life that should be in a student's, no child's eyes, were non-existent in his. Naruto's eyes were dull and didn't hold the twinkle or spark that other kids his age had, rather his eyes looked like they were neutral to the world. But he quickly regained his focus and proceeded with the exam. Smiling widely, Hiruka handed Naruto his headband with a congratulation in hand. Congratulations Naruto. I know that y'all succeed out in the field. However, instead of a smile or hug, he got a blank stare, a small bow, and a quiet thank you, before his student left the academy for home. I feel like y'all are going to become a great shinobi Naruto. I'm sorry that I couldn't support you through your schooling here, but I'll definitely try and help you out there. Looking at the retreating form of his student, Haruka expressed his final thoughts before calling the next person in line for the test. Seeing change outside the academy, after receiving his headband, Naruto put it into his pocket before he started on his way home. The last few years since his Aniki had passed were difficult, not from the treatment that he received from the people around his village, but from the scroll that he received from him. Looking back, when he was coping with Ryuhei's death he was acting like a spoiled brat who had their favorite toy taken away, angrily lashing out at anyone and hating the world for taking away the one person who cared for him and the world. But that all changed once he actually looked inside of the scroll that his brother had left him. Flashback start two and a half years ago, huddled on the same shoreline that him and his brother were on when they first met, Naruto still cold and get over the fact that his brother was gone, even after half a year of grieving. Why, why do I always have to have something taken away from me? First it was my family's love and now Ryu Naichin. Why? 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 Naruto was growing progressively more angry and hateful at this world who took away the only person who cared for him and was about to do something regrettable that was until a scroll fell out of his backpack as he stood up. Looking down, he immediately recognized it as the last gift he had gotten from both his brother and anyone in the past few years. He had forgotten about it, having never opened it after figuring out that he'd never see his brother again. Holding the scroll carefully, it unraveled it and saw a seal. Recognizing it as a simple storage seal it released whatever was inside, which was a note. Reading it over, Naruto started to tear up, tightening his grip slightly and by extension, crumpling the note a little. Naruto, if you are reading this, then you probably know that I'm not going to be with you any longer. 
I'm sorry, I'm so sorry Naruto, I'm sorry that I won't get to see you graduate the academy, I'm sorry I won't get to celebrate your birthdays anymore with you, I'm sorry that I won't be able to embarrass you on a date with your girlfriend, I'm sorry that I'm such a horrible brother. I know that y'all probably never forgive me for leaving you behind, but know this, know that I'll always be looking out for you. Even now, I'm looking out for you. I know that you're upset, hurt, angry, sad, and a hundred other things, but never give in to any of those negative emotions at Tauto, they only lead to pain and more hate. I know that you are stronger than that, I'm the one who did train you remember. Naruto, inside this piece of paper is what I promised you on that day. It contains a large scroll which can only be opened by smearing you blood on it with a little bit of chakra, and it contains everything that I said it would. It has my life savings, down to the last ryo sealed within. My family's techniques and secrets, my own techniques and secrets, the weapons that I've collected and my own swords. It also contains all of my research on information on various things in the world that I hope you never reveal to anyone else. In addition it also contains my family's summoning contract, once you are old enough sign it and you will be reverse summoned to Thousand Blade Mountain the home of the dragons. Yes Naruto, the same dragons that I told you stories about. Once there don't be afraid, they all act mean, big and scary, but once you break past their scales they're all very kind and loyal. Ask for my partner, Joe, and tell him that you're my little brother and hell defend and vouch for you. After all that is settled find a partner will compliment you and that you can bond with. Y'all know when you find them, trust me. Naruto, remember that no matter what anyone says, you're the strongest and kindest person that I've known and had the pleasure to call my Itado. Don't give in to the hate that plagues this land, rise above it and prove that you have the blood of a dragon running through your veins. I've made a training schedule of Tai, Nin, Gen, Ken, Kin, and a little bit of Yuenjutsu for you for the next few years, along with training from the elders, until you turn 18, and I know that Yao will be able to follow it and benefit from it, after that I'm sure Yao will have already mastered everything that I've to teach you. Lastly, find a someone who you can relate to and get to know them. Find someone who you can trust without reason and if possible, find happiness with someone Naruto. I know that Yao will make me proud and that Yao will become a great shinobi. So until we meet again in the afterlife Naruto, remember that I love you and that I'm always watching over you. By the end of the letter, Naruto was sobbing loudly, wiping his tears away with the sleeve of his jacket. After sobbing for over half an hour, Naruto made a promise to himself that he would follow what his brother asked him to do, to train, and to hopefully find happiness. But as far as Naruto was concerned, becoming strong was the top priority on his list. The first thing he did was nick his thumb, smear his blood over the seal and begin training. Ryu Naijin. I will become strong, so that once we meet again, I'll be able to stand next to you as your brother. Flashback end, sighing to himself, he could only be embarrassed that he acted like he did, his partner would be mortified if he ever found out. But once he got over Ryuhei's death, he began to notice things that started to unnerve him greatly. Over the past two years, he started to notice that people were starting to pay more attention to him. It originally started out small with people actually looking at him, instead of through him. That would have been fine, as he didn't really want anything to do with people, as his only objective was to follow his training schedule, however last year was when it got to the point where they started talking to him. Originally he wanted to ignore them like they had done to him, but he remembered that his brother asked him to be above hate, and doing that would undoubtedly cause people to hate him, so he settled for giving quick responses which worked for quite some time. That is until his family started to try to talk to him. Menma was the same arrogant and obnoxious person Naruto remembered him to be. Mido and Narumi acted like nothing had ever come between them, talking to him in an overly familiar way which irritated him to no end, and his parents were the worst. They tried to coddle him like some child, they were a few years late for that as he was already self-sufficient by the time Ryuhei had adopted him as his younger brother. It got worse when they tried to include him into their training sessions, which he always skipped out of, their training years behind his in his opinion. Though he desperately wanted to snap at them and demand the reason as to why they were suddenly acting like he always existed, he knew it would be waste of time. In the end, he treated them the same way he treated everyone else, distant and without any form of attachment. But slowly, Ryuhei's words of not giving in to the hate and finding happiness in his life were starting to take effect on him. While he knew he wouldn't love his family he wouldn't hate them either, at least not until they did something to garner one or the other. His thoughts were broken when he spotted the same people he was just thinking about, his family happily chatting with other families about their kids. Closing his eyes and ignoring the happenings around him, he just carried on his way home, that is until someone put their hand on his shoulder. He didn't even need to open his eyes to know that it belonged to his father Minato. Cracking one eye open, he glanced at his father with the same dull look in his eye and questioned him as to why he was stopped. Is there a reason why you are stopping me? Naruto asked, his voice quiet without a hint of warmth or familiarity. 
Leonardo had seen his oldest walking out of the classroom alone, without waiting for his siblings to finish. Deciding that it might help mend the relationship that they had, he stopped his son. However, while he expected the tone of voice and look that his son gave him, it still pained him greatly. Over the course of the past two years, Minato had begun to notice that he didn't feel the unease that he used to feel when he saw Naruto. Before, he felt the same way he did about a stranger interacting with his family, but that slowly started to change. At first he was suspicious, but as time went on, the feeling of unease completely disappeared and it was replaced with a longing to reconnect with his son. However, his plan to reconnect Naruto with the family failed miserably. He avoided speaking to any of them for more than a sentence, two if they were lucky, and when he did speak, he spoke with an overly formal manner, his voice quiet and without a hint of warmth, not even calling him Tusan and Kashina Kasan anymore. It was like speaking to a stranger one had just met. Though, Minato wasn't deterred, he was set on reconnecting the bond that they all once had. I wanted to ask why you are leaving already, or aren't you going to wait for your siblings to finish Naruto? asked Minato in a soft tone of voice, a voice Naruto had only recently been exposed to personally, and it unnerved him slightly to hear it from someone other than Ryuhei. However Naruto answered him sorry Minato-san, but I would rather not wait for them. Please excuse me. Though as he turned to leave, he was met by a red-headed missile, his mother Kashina. Kashina like Minato, lost the apprehension that she used to have when she saw and interacted with Naruto, and was doing her absolute best to try and get her son back into the family. Though she was met with the same treatment as her husband and everyone else for that manner. Nerichan. Congrats on passing your genin exams. Where were you going? You are going to wait for your siblings to finish right. Kashina released Naruto from her hug and asked him in confused manner. She then looked at Minato and saw him shake his head which made her frown. Nerichan, you need to wait for you siblings you know. It's only polite since they're your family. Kashina scolded Naruto, however he just looked back at her with the same blank navy blue eyes before retorting. Ishina-san, you know that they've never been made to wait for me before. Why should I be expected to wait for them when they haven't shown the same courtesy to me? Naruto questioned, and Kashina winced at this dismissal of calling her Kakan, but brushed it off, though she found herself unable to answer his question. He was right in his statement, she never made any of her other children wait for their older brother, but this only served to fuel her desire to unite her family once and for all. Nari-chan, I know that we're not on the best terms as family. I know that for a long, long time we've been very bad parents and your siblings haven't been the best either. But we're still family you know, and family needs to care for each other and stick together. Kashina spoke in a soft tone, looking at her oldest in the eyes. Once Kashina said those words, Naruto's mind flashed back to the memories that he shared with Ryuhei, then to the words that he had told him about what a real family was. Family is supposed to love you unconditionally and care for you without having to be asked to. From what Yav told me, they rent your family. They're just people who share the same blood as you, that alone does not define family you know. Snapping out of his short stroll through his memories, he figured it would be less of a hassle if he just entertained their request. Crossing his arms, Naruto turned towards the academy waiting for his siblings to emerge. Seeing their oldest listen to their request and accept it made Minato and Kashina happy beyond words, if the matching smiles on their faces were any indication. They knew that they would have a long and difficult road towards rebuilding their relationship with their son, but they owed it to him. The guilt and shame that plagued their hearts were unfathomable seeing how their oldest was practically a stranger and his own family tore at their hearts, and they knew that it was their fault and theirs alone. Over the last two years, the feelings that they should have always had for him slowly started to surface for the first time in their lives, that alone confused and frightened them. From viewing their oldest son as a stranger and potential threat to the safety of their family to seeing him as what he really was, as their oldest son who they love and care for, it baffled them to no end. But after having a heart-to-heart -heart with each other, Minato and Kashina had promised to reconnect their oldest and give him the love that he deserved and more. Soon, the two were broken out of their thoughts as they were the telltale signs of their youngest daughter, if her shouting of Tusan and Kachan were any indication. Naramis Day couldn't have gotten better, she had just passed her genin exams and made it as one of the top contenders for Kanoichi of the Year and Rookie of the Year, along with her brothers and sister. Though, there was one thing that did make her sad and that her heart yearned for, that was the love and attention of her oldest brother, Naruto. She knew that she was never the ideal little sister towards her brother. Ever since she could remember, she felt afraid of him. When they were growing up, she could remember that whenever she would try and ask him to play with her or talk to him, there would be a feeling of fear that would overtake her heart and cause her to stop. It only got worse as she grew up, as she got older whenever she would see her big brother, something inside of her as a human being screamed that he was dangerous and to stay away from him at all costs. Of course, she was a child then and followed her instincts, but looking back she regretted every moment of it. Though, the last two years were strange. 
the primal fear that she had for her brother slowly started to fade away, and in its place was replaced by adoration and desire for her brother to accept and forgive her for all she's done. Now the only thing that stood in her way of loving her brother was him, himself. But that wasn't going to stop her from getting what she wanted, everyone knew that Inuzumaki never gave up until they've got what they wanted. After catching the sight of her mother's striking crimson hair and her father's brilliant blonde, Narumi cheerfully ran towards them. Happiness and excitement filling her heart, she was about to launch herself at them until she caught sight of a slightly darker shade of blonde next to them. It was her brother, Naruto. Her brother was waiting for her. He was really waiting for her. Did he finally forgive her? A light dusting of pink colored her cheeks as she changed the trajectory of her hug and instead of her parents, launched herself at her brother. Naranai. Narumi squealed happily and with affection as she met her target, wrapping her brother in a hug. Naranai, did you wait for me, did you really? I hope you didn't wait too long. I'm sorry if you did. I really am. Narumi fired off questions as to how long her brother had waited and if he did it speakly for her. The say Naruto was uncomfortable would be putting it lightly, while he did expect to be greeted by his exuberant younger sister, he wasn't prepared to be glumped by her. Unless it was contact from sparring, he didn't do well with physical contact with others, he wasn't quite used to it yet. Slowly, he managed to detach the blonde from himself and was met with a pout in return. To answer your question Narumi, I am waiting for all of you to finish. And no, I didn't wait long. Naruto replied in his usual deadpan voice. Though that didn't deter Narumi for long, after hugging and getting the congratulations from her parents, she went right back to Naruto and hugged his arm to her chest with a cherry smile on her face. Okay Naranai. Well for Mido Ni and Menmanai together then. Narumi chirped with a smile on her face, much to Naruto's chagrin. Naruto could only sigh as his sister giggled as she tightened her grip on him. Off on the side, Minato and Kishina could only smile at the scene, Narumi always managed to ignore the cold and distant aura that Naruto had, and it always warmed their hearts to see their youngest able to breach the armor around their son's heart. Soon, they spotted the blonde and crimson hair of their remaining two children, both with smiles on their faces. Menma was feeling like he was on top of the world, not only did he destroy the genin exam, he was sure that he'd be the one who'd become rookie of the year. However, his mood quickly rose as he saw his family waiting for him with smiles on their faces. Quickening his pace, he ran towards them only for his mood to drop like a rock and lake. He saw his brother there as well. It was well known in the village that Menma didn't like his brother, the word most would use would be detested or disgusted, however that wasn't how Menma truly felt. Menma had admired his older brother when they were young, always imitating what he would do when they were children. But as he grew older, he began to feel inferior to his brother for some reason. It only grew as they did, Menma becoming more vocal and demanding when Naruto would speak his mind or give a suggestion, in order to overrule Naruto's suggestion with his own. Eventually, Menma's feeling of inferiority turned into dislike which eventually created a gap between the two. During the past two years, Menma's feelings of inferiority and hate began to fade away, though he still did not view Naruto as his equal, nor treat him any differently. Menma had seen his grades both written and physical, and he knew that he was definitely stronger and smarter than his brother. Menma won't be apologizing to his older brother anytime soon, not until Naruto is able to stand as his equal. Though in a small part of Menma's heart, he honestly did want to become close to his brother again, so that they would be able to do things that only brothers are be able to do like talk about which girl is the cutest, pulling pranks together, and especially train together. But being as prideful as he was, Menma won't be admitting that anytime soon. His face visibly souring, Menma sneered at his brother. What the heck are you doing here loser? Should you still be begging Sensei to let you pass? Menma spat out, his eyes narrowed. Minato and Kishina were well aware of their son's volatile relationship, but they didn't think that it was this bad. But before they could say anything, the final member of their family spoke out in her older brother's defense. Mito was happy, rather she was ecstatic. She had seen her older brother pass his test, and the possibility that they would be on the same team had increased. Like Narumi, when she was young, Mito had a primal fear of her older brother for some strange reason. But like everyone else, within the last two years her fear disappeared and was replaced with the same adoration and desire for her older brother's love and affection that Narumi had. Though unlike her sister, Mito didn't rush in like Narumi did, her philosophy was try and slowly work her way back into her older brother's heart. But there were times where she would break that, and this was one of those times. Menma, didn't you see that Naruto Nai was one of the first to earn his headband? You're always sitting in the front to rent you. Mito said her eyes narrowed at Menma's insult towards her older brother. Though, when she saw her younger sister so closely attached to him, Mido's eye twitched in both irritation and jealousy. But before anything else happened, Naruto decided to finally speak up. Well, now that the exams are over it'll be seeing you all later. 
Managing to once again pull his arm free of his youngest sister's, grasp Naruto started walking away, unconcerned with the slightly hurt look in his family's eyes and the angry look in Menma's. Best making him wait for everyone to finish was asking for too much Mina-kun. Kishina said sadly looking at the retreating form of her son. Feeling an arm wrap around her waist, Minato pulled her in close and gave her a reassuring squeeze. It'll be okay Kushi-chan. After comforting his wife, Minato turned towards his remaining children. Alright kids, why don't we go get something special to eat in honor of all of you becoming genin. Instantly he got eager nods from his kids, though one voiced her concerns. Nah, too san. What about Narunai? Should we go get him? Narumi asked the question on both her and Mito's mind, and even a tiny bit of Menma's. Smiling at her consideration of her older brother, Minato patted her head. You know how your brother likes his space Yumi-chan, we'll all be able to have dinner together one day. I promise. Seeing his daughter sadly nod her head, he decided to take lead them into the village for a night of celebrations. Scene change unknown lake. Arriving at his destination just as the sun was starting to set, Naruto once again found himself at the lake where he and Ryuhei met, a gentle breeze blowing. Smiling slightly, he reminisced about the fond memories that he had with his older brother. Reaching into his backpack, he pulled out a familiar scroll. Unsealing small, small bottle of sake and saucer from a seal that read graduation, Naruto filled up a saucer and smiling, he poured it carefully into the lake, before filling it once again to down it himself. The bottle only held enough sake for two saucers, and that was enough for Naruto. Laying down on his back his arms crossed behind his head, he let his mind flow back to the times he shared with his older brother, as he closed his eyes. As Naruto listened to the soft blow of the breeze, he didn't notice the silhouette of the person sit down next to him. As the wind blew his hair gently, the silhouette slowly reached over and ruffled his hair softly. As he felt a very warm and familiar sensation, Naruto slowly descended to the world of sleep, as his mind slowed the ambient noises of the wind quieted to nothingness, he caught a voice in the wind. Naruto fell asleep, never noticing the tears that were falling down his face and the small smile on his lips. Congratulations Ataudo. Inside the office of the Hokage, two figures could be seen discussing a topic that was on the minds of everyone who were associated with the newly graduated genin, that topic being the teams that they would be placed on. Heading the meeting was of course, Minato, being the Hokage he had the final word as to who was on what team with which instructor. Given a record of each individual genin, listing their strengths, weaknesses, special attributes, and other notable traits. The second was the final of the Densetsu no Sanin, Arachimaru. Arachimaru was once considered a traitor, having been arrested after suspicion about what went on in the lab that he operated. Having no doubts about his innocence, he willingly let the Anbu squad led by Minato and Jiraiya search his lab. However, what he didn't expect was to be attacked by his best friend and Minato, then have suppression seals put on him. At first he was outraged, demanding why he was being arrested, but soon that anger turned into shock as he was saw what was inside of his lab. His lab, normally spotless and sterile, was covered in blood and gore. At first, he thought it was a Jinjutsu that someone had placed on him, but after futilely trying to release it, he knew that it wasn't an illusion. After he was taken to Ibiki Marino for interrogation. Though, after he asked that they have Inachi Yamanaka to prove his innocence by reviewing the past few hours of his life, they apologized and released the seals on him. During the interrogation, they had found that it is second apprentice Kabuto who had framed him. Kabuto had been stealing information and resources from his lab for his ex-teammate Haruko, who was banished after his experiments on human subjects were found by Rachimaru and Jiraiya. Though, they were unable to find Kabuto even with multiple squads of Anbu dispatched throughout the village. After the incident, Minato and Jiraiya apologized for their mistake, Jiraiya speakly. However, he brushed them off saying that they were only doing their duty and that he would have done the same. Originally he was bitter and angry that his sensei and the Sandame Hokage, Hiruzen Siratobi, had chosen Minato as the Yandame. But after Hiruzen talked to him about his reason, he grudgingly accepted. But slowly, he grew to like the boy thanks in part to Jiraiya forcing him out of his lab to meet with him for a drink from time to time. Now, he was the head of the torture and interrogation force and main consultant when it came to building teams as he oversaw all outgoing genin from the academy and had some insight as to what went on inside of their minds due to his position. That being said Minato, what do you think of those for the potential team builds? Arachimaru asked, showing Minato a diagram with multiple different team compositions, ranging from tracking, assault and support. After pointing out the candidates that would only be able to fill one role due to their skill set, he brought out a chart showing the candidates that could fill multiple roles in a squad. So far the teams look great, thank you Arachimaru. Minato expressed his sincere thanks, as squad building in the past was a difficult process of basically putting Genin together and seeing if they would work or not. But with Orochimaru, squads that have been assembled with his inside have had a 94.7% rate of successful squad dynamics. But I am concerned about one thing. 
Orochimaru was a little surprised as usually Minato almost never any qualms over the suggestions that he made, though he had a sneaking suspicion as to what it was about. What's your concern Minato? It's over your children isn't it? His suspicions were validated when Minato rubbed the back of his head in embarrassment. Minato voiced his confusion as to why his oldest wasn't included on the possible squad list. Yeah, you hit it right on the mark Orochimaru. I wanted to know I didn't see Naruto's name on any of the squad suggestions that you showed me. After hearing his question, Orochimaru sighed. Minato, you and I both know that your oldest son was treated like he never existed by both his family and the village, myself included. Though we both know that, because of that he doesn't trust anyone not even you. Orochimaru stated, seeing how Minato was about to retort. Do you know how he performed in the academy Minato? After hearing the question, Minato frowned and nodded his head. I do Rachimaru, from what I hear from practically everyone, has the dead last of the academy. Even more so than the students who weren't serious on becoming ninja. His performance on the written and physical exams bring barely passable, it's actually a miracle that he passed. Minato said, his voice thick with guilt and shame. That being said, have you ever seen his actual scores and performance on the written and physical exams? Seeing Minato shake his head in the negative, Orochimaru took out Naruto's file and handed it to Minato. After taking it and opening, he didn't see what Orochimaru was trying to hint at. Though he did wince when he saw how poorly his son did. Seeing that Minato didn't get it, Orochimaru could only sigh. You don't see it do you Minato, isn't it suspicious that his grades are more varied? How on every single exam, physical and written, he has managed to score one point above the failing threshold. That alone warrants suspicion, it's as if he is deliberately placing himself low in order to conceal his strengths, now that I'm thinking about it more clearly, I'm sure that Hess intentionally hiding his skills. Though for what reason, I'm not sure of. Orochimaru said, his brows furrowed in thought. Minato just cold trap his mind around why his oldest would intentionally hide his skill, if he was as skilled as Orochimaru was making him out to be. But why hide his skills? If he has the skill, why doesn't he show them to everyone? It sounds as if you are making him out to be a prodigy, if he was, he'd be the talk of the village. That's why I didn't place him with any of squads that I made Minato. I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but my personal assessment of him is that has a potential flight risk. He trusts no one in the village, and because of that has no loyalty or love for it either. As soon as Arachimaru finished his assessment, he was met with an angry and accusatory glare from Minato. What are you implying Arachimaru? Are you saying that my son is a potential threat to his squad mates and sensei, and a threat to the village? Minato wasn't happy that Orochimaru thought of his son as a threat to the safety of his ninja and village. He knew that Isam wasn't treated the best, but he won't turn on the village. Would he? Seeing that Minato was feeling conflicted on this matter, Orochimaru relented. Minato, ill assign Naruto to a squad on the condition that my apprentice be his sensei. Not only because I trust her and you trust me, but she's one of the only people in the village that would be able to assess his mental state from observation alone. The only others being myself, Jiraiya, Tsunade, Ibiki, and Shizune. But I don't think that they should be removed from their posts for one genin, even if that genin is possibly unstable in your son. Minato thought about the situation deeply, on one hand he wanted to trust his instincts that his son wasn't a threat, but considering that Orochimaru said about him trusting no one was undoubtedly true, eventually, he had to place his village over his son, as much as it pained him to do so. Alright Orochimaru, let's go with your plan. He'll trust that Anko won't be too Anko, right? Seeing Orochimaru's wry smile in return, he could only hope that his son doesn't get pushed to the edge by his sensei. Well now that we have that settled, let's rebuild the squads then starting with the ones who have the most flexibility in regards to possible positions. As he brought out a rooster and proceeded to highlight and circle prime individuals. Seen change Naruto's training ground, back in the area that he and Ryuhei had first met, Naruto was going over his plan for the future. Having become a genin, he had also become an adult in the world. His first order of business was to move out of the compound that his family lived in and find his own place to call home. The second regarded a much more serious topic, the being the dead last facade that he had built up over the past four years. It had worked as he intended in getting people to underestimate him, even if he was the son of the Hokage. But the problem now lied in whether or not he actually started to act seriously. Making such a large jump in skill would definitely raise alarms with everyone that knew him, especially his family, but considering no one ever paid attention to him, he could just write it off as him not trying, because it won't be worth the effort. That seemed like a plausible yet paper-thin excuse, but it do, he didn't need to explain his reasons to anyone. The final topic was one that was a bit touchy, but he needed to get over it. Now that he would be moving out and he was an adult, he needed to get over the fact the village basically erased his existence from it. Well he wasn't going to betray the village or curse it, he won't love it. It'd be just a place where he ate, slept, and worked for, the same would be applied to the people of the village. 
had act professionally with his teammates, his sensei, the merchants, villagers, other ninja, and his family. He wasn't going to let anywhere near his heart ever again, had part in their past transgressions, but that be it. His plan set, he headed towards his soon-to-be ex-home. I'm skip one week later, seeing change Kanoha Academy. Iruka's classroom, seeing the uncontained energy and excitement of his students, Iruka could only smile at them. Until they were ignoring the fact that the bell had rung. All right everyone, sit down and quiet. Implementing his village-renowned Kayatu no Jutsu, his students immediately quieted down and finally focused their attention to him. Good, now that I have your attention it'll be naming the squads that the Hokage has assigned you to. Starting with the students with limited skill sets, the squad list slowly approached the rounded genin. Team 7 will consist of. Menma, Nido and Narumi Uzumaki Namikas. Your sensei Kakashi Haddock at that moment, many groans and complaints rang out about the newly dubbed strongest team, Team Hokage's kids. Most were about the loss of their crush to be on their team. Though the genin involved only let their heads pound the desk the unfortunate luck of having to stick with and deal with their siblings even when out on missions and of having to deal with their perverted and habitually late older brother figure. After quieting down the class once more, Haruka continued. Teammate will consist of. Hinata Hayuga, Kiba Inuzuka, and Shino Aburam. Your sensei, Kuranaiki. Team 9 is still active. Team 10 will consist of. Ino Yamanaka, Shikamara Nara, and Choji Akimichi. Your sensei, Asuma Siratobi. At that, Ino practically broke the desk she was at when her head slammed onto it. Crying about how she was put on the worst possible team, well behind her Shikamara muttered a quiet menkuse. His eye twitching slightly at the rude behavior of his student, Haruka could only sigh before continuing. Team 11 will consist of. Sasuke Chiha, Sakura Haruno, and Sai. Your sensei, Genma Shiranui. Though, he was once again interrupted when Sakura rose out of her seat and flashed a victory sign at Ino, claiming that the power of love prevails over all obstacles, as Sasuke let his head drop. For the final time, Iruka could only drop his head at his student's behavior before calling out the final team. The final team will be Team 12, which will consist of Yakumo Kurama, Satsuki Achiha, and Naruto Uzumaki Namikas. Your sensei, Anko Midarashi. At that, the class went deathly quiet, and some slowly turned their eyes towards the back where their most distant classmates sat. Of course, the lull was broken when Aruka announced that their senseis would be coming to pick them up soon. As soon as that statement left his mouth, Kurunai arrived to pick up her team. Following her were Asuma and Genma. Left in the room were Team 7 and 12, Team 7 already knowing that they had a long way ahead of them. After half an hour, the window flew open, followed by a kunai attached to a banner that read the great and why Anko Midarashi has arrived, as a smoke bomb went off. Out of the smoke emerged Anko wearing her signature grin and glint in her eyes. Seeing the disbelief in the eyes of the genin, she couldn't help but snicker at them. Well, which of you brats belong to me? If you are a part of my team, then we're meeting at training ground 12 in 15 minutes. Don't be later it'll hunt you down, on second thought please be late. It'll make things more fun for me. Jana. After saying her part, she jumped out the window. After processing what just happened, Naruto let out a sigh as he stood up and walked out the door towards the training ground. Seeing their teammate leave, Satsuki and Yakumo followed him out the door leaving Team 7 behind. Scene changed training ground 12. Arriving with 3 minutes left to spare, Naruto, Satsuki and Yakumo stood awkwardly as they waited for their sensei to arrive. But they didn't have to wait long, as a pouting Anko dropped from the tree that they were standing under. You brats are no fun at all, it would've been more interesting and fun if I had to find and drag you here. But oh well, why don't we get to know each other? Anko happily said, but instead of a quick response she got blank stares. But that was quickly broken when Yakumo raised her hand to ask a question. Um, Anko-sensei, could you begin? I don't think that we know the proper way to introduce ourselves. Yakumo asked, unsure on how to break the ice with her new team. But her concerns were eliminated as her sensei gave a grin and started things off. Well I'm Anko Midarashi as you all know. My likes are snakes, Arachimaru sensei, my best friend Kurunai, Dango, poison, sharp things, and reading. My hate perverts, rapists, people who act like they're superior to others, bad Dango, and a boring book. My hobbies are working at the T&I division and hanging out with my friends. And my goal is to one day surpass Arachimaru sensei as his apprentice. Now that I'm done, why don't you go next since you asked. After her introduction, Anko turned towards Yakumo and decided that she was the next one to introduce herself. I'm Yakumo Kurama, nice to meet all of you. My likes are reading, training with my tutor Kurunai sensei, reading, Machi and being with my family. I also hate perverts, rapists, people who mock others for stupid reasons or reasons outside of their control, and people who look down on Jinjutsu users. My hobbies are cooking, gardening, flower arranging and training. 
My goal is to repay Minato and Kishina-sama for sealing off the Ido and giving me back my life, and to surpass Kurenai-sensei as a Jinjutsu master. Yakumo stated with a small fire burning in her eyes towards the end. After her introduction, Anko pointed towards the scowling Satsuki. Nice to meet you Yakumo-chan. So you're the one that Nai-chan always talks about huh? Why don't you go next Miss Sunshine? As Yakumo blushed slightly, Satsuki growled at Anko and received a grin in return. M. Satsuki Acha. My likes are training, reading, cooking and gardening. I hate our perverts, rapists, weaklings, useless people, and people who break their promises. My hobbies are pretty much the same as my likes. And my goal is to surpass my brother Itachi as a ninja and my mother as a woman. Tsutsuki said in her usual snarky tone though it turned surprisingly bashful when she mentioned surpassing her mother as a woman. Smirking at the her, Anko finally pointed to the only male member of the squad and gestured him to begin. Alright, well the ladies are done so why don't you introduce yourself blondie? Half expecting a twitching of the eyebrows or a glare, Anko was a little surprised when all she received was a blank stare from Naruto. My name is Naruto Uzumaki Namikas. I don't have many likes, though one is Raymond. I don't have many dislikes either, though most of them are shared between us like perverts and rapist. My hobby is training. As for my goal my goal is to make someone proud of me. Introducing himself in his usual deadpan, Naruto finished his introduction. Though, his goal caused quite a stir within his squad, all of them knew that he had no bonds to speak of, so this person he wanted to make proud had to have been someone special. And who would that be Blondie? Very curious, Anko asked the obvious question however she was met with his patented blank stare once more, followed by it doesn't concern you. Which irked her a lot, but instead of acting on it now she decided it was a good time to let her Jenna know about the test that they would be given. Well, now that most of us have introduced ourselves, she shot Naruto a look. Yara's still not truly Jenna of the Leaf yet. You all still have one more test that you need to get through before Yara field ready. So, tomorrow. Meet back here at 10am sharp and don't eat any breakfast, I promise you that Yao will just see it again within the hour. But that, Anko disappeared in a swirl of leaves using the Shunshin no Jutsu. After their sensei left, Satsuki and Yakumo gave each other a glance. They weren't on the best terms but we weren't on the worst either. Most of this stemmed from Satsuki and Mido's rivalry, Yakumo somehow getting caught in the middle. However, they were on a team now, so it was in their best interest to get along, at least that was Yakumo's train of thought. Tsutsuki, I know that we're not best friends or friends at all, so why don't we start now since we're on a team now? Yakumo asked, hoping that she'd accept her offer of friendship. Tsutsuki really wanted to just leave and go home to train or cook or do something other than get along with Abmido's friends, but she knew that she'd get an earful from her parents and older brother if she didn't at least try to get to know her, so she just sighed and accepted. Sure, whatever. Just don't try and be all chummy with me, we're not friends just teammates. And don't tell Mido either, it'd rather not hear her complain about how I'm stealing her best friend. Nodding to Satsuki, they two began to head towards the center of the village, but before they left the training ground, they froze. Remembering that they had one more teammate, they turned around to see that he was already walking away or eating a scroll. Looking at each other, they didn't know what they should do, though they settled on trying to invite him, considering how that was the most that they've heard him talk, so they assumed that it would be alright to ask. Naruto, do you want to come get dinner with us? We might as well considering we're all on a team now, so we should try to get along. Yakumo asked, as they managed to catch up to the blonde. However, she was met with silence as he was too engrossed in his scroll to notice her and Satsuki. While Yakumo was a little amused, having had moments where she also tuned out the world when reading, Satsuki didn't take being ignored too kindly. Growling while she stomped towards him, she grabbed his shoulder and forced him to stop. Naruto was almost finished with the scroll that the elders had given him when he felt a hand on his shoulder and smelled sweat with a hint of lily of the valley, and upon turning around he was met with an angry Acha. Is there something that I can help you with Satsuki-san? Naruto asked, wondering why the usually brooding and scowling girl stopped him. Are you weak and deaf we've been trying to get your attention for the past minute? Kami, why did I have to be paired with you out of all of the other Uzumaki Namikas, Menma world been better, it even settled for Mido. As Satsuki went on a tangent, Naruto could only stare at her blankly, as Yakumo sighed beside her. Having had enough of her rambling, Naruto poked her on the forehead similar to how he had seen her older brother do, and the reaction was almost instantaneous, as she snapped out of her rambling immediately. Wow what are you doing you idiot? Just don't touch me whenever you feel like it you pervert. Satsuki shouted, her cheeks tinged red with embarrassment and anger. It was then that Yakumo decided to step in before things got even more complicated than they already were. Naruto, Satsuki and I wanted to know if you wanted to get dinner together to celebrate our new status as a team and to get to know each other better. So would you come with us? Yakumo asked politely, hoping that he'd accept their offer. 
they got their answer when the scroll he was reading disappeared in a puff of smoke, and he stared at them with his ever blank eyes. You two have a point, we might as well get to know our strengths and weaknesses, knowing how we can complement each other could greatly benefit us in the future, including on the test tomorrow. Naruto stated, and from the stunned expressions on his teammates' faces, they weren't exactly thinking on the same terms. After that a blank-faced Naruto, a wryly laughing Yakumo, and a scowling pink-faced Satsuki enter a popular barbeque restaurant to get to know each other better. For the better portion of the night, there were laughs heard from the booth as the three or rather Yakumo and Satsuki exchanged stories from their past, while Naruto chose to remain silent as he didn't have many fond memories that he was willing to share, though he did share a story about an incident he was involved in that included a corrupt merchant, bees, honey, ants, paint, a bikini, and cameramen. He didn't expect the normally brooding and scowling Satsuki to burst out laughing and snorting as tears began to fall from her eyes or the reserved and polite Yakumo to laugh so much that she started crying with her sides hurting. The night ended with the three parting ways, Yakumo and Satsuki in better moods and a small smile gracing their faces. Scene change Uzumaki Namaka's compound. As he walked through the front door, he was greeted by the sight of his family chatting and eating dinner happily amongst each other. Though he was used to the sight, it still caused a dull ache in his heart. As he was quietly making his way upstairs towards his room, he was spotted by his more expressive sister before he could make it up the stairs. As Narumi was happily chatting with her family about her new team, though her brother and sister lacked the same enthusiasm she had, she spotted a familiar mop of blonde hair and her night instantly brightened up even more. Standing up on her chair, which Kashina instantly started scolding her, she called out to him. Narunai. Where have you been? Why are you home so late? Come down here and have dinner with us. As soon as those words left her mouth, the rest of her family's head snapped to where she was looking. But she never got a response as they heard the door to his room being closed softly. Knowing that her brother wasn't going to be joining them, Narumi sank back into her chair and slowly continued to eat, sad and hurt by his indifference. While Narumi quieted down, Mido continued looking where she had seen her brother with longing in her eyes before she went back to her meal quieter than before. Menma continued seemingly unaffected by his brother's indifference, though inside he was wondering what his weak older brother was doing out so late. Minato and Kishina were both hurt and upset by the attitude and behavior of their oldest. Hurt that he didn't greet them when he got home, and upset that he made their youngest sad by his attitude. The two exchanged sad looks before they continued with dinner, knowing that the happy mood and light was spoiled. Scene changed Naruto's room. As Naruto entered his room, he contemplated on what would be the test for tomorrow. Knowing the strengths and weaknesses of his teammates, it would definitely make things go by much more smoothly than having to assume what they were in the heat of the moment. Most likely they would have to go on a mission as a show of proficiency and their ability to operate as a unit. Starting tomorrow, he would be able to drop his facade and actually experience the world as a capable shinobi. Laying down on his bed, Naruto slowly fell into a dreamless sleep. Scene change training ground 12. As the morning sun laid lazily overhead, Naruto, Satsuki, and Yakumo were sitting under the large sakura tree that laid in the center of the training ground. Satsuki had her scowl on her face, though she was sneaking side glances at the only male member of their squad. Yakumo was reading a book, and like Satsuki, she was sneaking glances at Naruto before focusing back to her book and repeating the process. Naruto was immersed in a scroll that contained information about team dynamics and how to best operate as a unit, including tactics, positions, weakness, and mistakes. Eventually, the lull of the moment was broken as their sensei made her explosive entrance, literally, as a smoke bomb exploded with her jumping out of it, her signature grin on her face. Well looks like y'all are all ready for the test I assume. Seeing the scowl, small frown, and blank look, Anko cold help but sweat dropped slightly at the less than expressive faces of her students. Well then, why don't we begin? The test we'll be having is the good old-fashioned bell test. All you have to do is take a bell from me and you pass. Simple right? Enko said happily, pulling out two silver bells out of her pocket. As soon as they saw the bells, Yakumo voiced a concern that all genin who received the test had. Enko sensei, but they are three of us. Why are there only two bells? As soon as the words left her mouth, Enko revealed a devious smirk before saying something that instantly set her genin off. Because, the one who doesn't manage to get a bell from me is going to go back to the academy and repeat the whole thing over again. Anko chirped happily, relishing in the tense and stressed expressions on her genin's faces. Though, she did notice that the only male of the squad had his blank stare still in place. Alright then. Let the test begin. As soon as she said that, the two female members rushed into the woods leaving her and Naruto behind. Raising an eyebrow, she gave Naruto a confused look. Um you know that you're supposed to hide in plan right? However, instead of a reply, Naruto walked back to the Sakura tree and sat down. Opting to finish reading the scroll and partake in the test at the moment. 
Ang Ko could only gawk at the audacity of the kid, not only did he not answer her, which alone wolf involved her using sharp things to make him answer her, he ignored the fact that he had a test going on. But she was broken out of her thoughts as a volley of shuriken forced her to jump back to avoid being hit. Tsutsuki was angry, she was angry and tense, most of which came from the stupid test that her sensei had given them. Not only would one of them fail, they'd have to go through the whole academy again, and that was something she won't be taking a part of. After she had hidden herself in a few meters back, she saw her idiot of a teammate just give up without lifting a finger. She knew that he was the dead last of the academy, but that didn't mean that he should give in without a fight. Not that she cared if he passed anything like that, but then she noticed that when he was walking back to the tree, her sensei let down her guard and she took advantage of it by throwing a handful of shuriken and charging in. After closing in the distance between, she started the bout with her sensei off with Tujutsu. Anko grinned, seeing that things were finally about to get interesting. Satsuki quickly fell into the rhythm of her clan's konkin. The key component of the Achiha clan's Tujutsu relied heavily on using one Sharingan to predict the moves of the opponent and respond with quick yet powerful blows hence the name. However, Satsuki not having her Sharingan yet, cold utilize it to its full extent. Quickly throwing a flurry of jabs and kicks, Satsuki quickly grew frustrated as Anko avoided each of her attacks like they were nothing. Throwing another hook towards Anko's midsection, Satsuki had her wrist grab pulled, knocking her off balance. Responding by twisting her body, she tried to deliver an axe kick but hit air as Anko backed away. A little admit Gaki, you are not too shabby at your tojutsu, for a genin at least. Anko's taunt seemed to have the intended effect as she saw her student's face flush red. Growling, Satsuki rushed in again and threw another punch that was deflected, quickly spinning around she a backhanded Anko that she avoided by crouching and sweeping Satsuki off her feet. Regaining her balance, Satsuki quickly went through a series of hand seals that made Anko's eyes go wide. Finishing the last of the seals, Satsuki glared at Anko before taking in a deep breath. Suetan. Tepandama. Firing off a quick basketball-sized bowl of water that hit Anko and sent her flying back before she was replaced with a gouged-out log. Whoa, that's one dangerous jutsu gaki. It'd be torn up for sure if I got hit by that. You need to be more care if dropping out of a tree, Anko praised and scolded Satsuki, but before she finished a rain of kunai forced her to perform another kawarimi. Jumping out of the brush, Yakumo had a kunai in a reverse grip as she headed towards Satsuki, who wasn't happy to see her. What are you doing here? I don't need your help to get a bell, you saw that I almost had her right there. Satsuki was really frustrated, being toyed with by her playful sensei didn't sit well with her at all. Satsuki, I know that you are frustrated. But please listen to me. Though her teammate was irritable, Yakumo knew she had to get her to calm down or else they'd all fail. Seeing the angry but now focused face of her teammate, Yakumo began her assessment of the current situation at hand. We know that we need to get those bells right. From what we talked about last night, we don't know any of Naruto's skills, and going by his performance in the academy they probably aren't the best. That being said, I think we'll be able to get those bells with just the two of us. I don't like leaving him behind, I really don't, but we need to pass. I think well this will work, so here's the plan. Making a guilty face, Yakumo shot a glance towards their still reading teammate before relaying the plan she had devised to Satsuki. To say that she was surprised was an understatement, Satsuki had always thought that Yakumo was someone who was all about being friends with everyone, but seeing her leave Naruto out didn't sit well with Satsuki for some reason, but she needed to pass, so she agreed to the plan that she created, which was crafty in her opinion. Seeing that her two students were finished with their group huddle, Anko walked out of the brush with her grin still in place. Are the two of you time with your little team meeting? Komian, let's get things going again. Satsuki and Yakumo flashed through the hand seals for their respective jutsu, with Satsuki rushing in while Yakumo stayed back. Interesting, Satsuki is coming in to apply pressure, while Yakumo is most likely setting up a jinjutsu to throw me off. Not shabby for a couple of rookies. Thought Anko as she avoided another tepandama from Satsuki before she heard Yakumo. Hanashibari no jutsu. Yakumo called out as Anko felt a slight stiffening in her body as the Jinjutsu took effect. As Satsuki closed the distance once again, diving low for the bells that were tied to her waist. As she felt the cool touch of the metal, Satsuki cold help but smile as the plan that Yakumo made worked. But as quick as the feeling of success came, it left as Anko grabbed her wrist and locked it behind her back, making Satsuki yelp in pain as she was forced onto the ground. Ikumo's reaction was the same as Satsuki's, elated that her plan had worked, but her hopes were crushed as their sensei had broken out of her jinjutsu and subdued Satsuki without any problems. Grinning from ear to ear, Anko cold help but be impressed by the show of teamwork of the two girls. That was some good teamwork girls. Having one of you keep the pressure on me while the other immobilizes me, that was some plan. But then again, it wasn't good enough. 
As she finished her statement, noticed that the last member of the squad had disappeared, she wasn't the only one as Yukumo and Satsuki had noticed as well. Huh, where did Blondie go? Did he go home or something? Anko asked, seeing the confused expressions on her students, she figured that they had no idea either. But as she was about to get off Satsuki and go find him, she immediately jumped back to avoid a kick to the head that cut off a few hairs on her head. Anko was shocked, her eyes wide, she didn't notice him until the last second. If she had been any slower there's no doubt that she'd be hurting her even unconscious. After his kick missed, Naruto quickly grabbed Satsuki in a princess carry, ignoring her shouts to let her go, and jumped back to where Yakuma was. Putting the now scarlet Satsuki, he turned back to Anko and rushed her. Past was the unanimous thought of the group as Naruto stopped in front of Anko and proceeded to take her on into Jutsu. Bam, he hits Ing hard. And on top of that has fast, this is getting bad my arms are starting to go numb. Anko grunted feeling the heavy blows of her student as she blocked and parried his attacks, though she was caught off guard as a kick broke through her guard and sent her stumbling back, spittle flying out of her mouth from the heavy blow. Though his assault didn't stop there, as he charged in and slipped in behind her. Satsuki and Yukumo could only let their mouths hang open as they saw the scene unfolding in front of them. The dead last of their class was holding his own against a Jinin and the apprentice of Arachimaru no less. Anko was starting to get pissed, she had underestimated this brat, and he was actually starting to push her back, her. The apprentice of one of the Sanin. Catching her balance, she turned around with an kick that was blocked by Naruto. Following up, she threw a heavy punch that sent her student reeling back. Not letting him get his balance, she tackled him to the ground, straddling him and pinning his arms to the ground, a vicious smile on her face, and a predatory glint in her eyes. That ing hurt Gaki, I thought you were the dead last. There is no way that you're with those skills, why hide it huh? Anko questioned him, leering close to his face. Behind the two, Satsuki's face was once again scarlet looking at the scene of her sensei straddling her teammate. Next to her Yukumo covered her eyes, her scarlet face matching Satsuki's. But they were broken out of their embarrassed states when Naruto shouted at them. As Anko straddled him, Naruto reversed the grip she had on his wrists and held onto them tightly. After doing this, he turned towards his teammates and shouted at them to grab the bells. Satsuki. Yukumo. Shus open, grab the bells now. Hearing their teammate actually shout at them, they too quickly rushed towards their now immobile sensei to grab the bells. After hearing this Anko tried to break free, but her student's grip on her wrists won't budge. Knowing that it would be futile, Anko just sighed knowing that it was checkmate. Minutes later a smiling Satsuki and Yukumo were standing next to a blank-faced Naruto as Anko massaged her sore wrists, courtesy of the blonde in front of her. At first Anko sighed, but then she gave the three a grin as she knew that, unintentionally, they had managed to figure out the test. Congrats brats. You all pass. As she congratulated them, she was asked the question at hand by Satsuki. But Anko-sensei, we haven't decided on who would get the bells yet. Satsuki questioned, knowing that Naruto would probably get one since he did give them the chance to grab them. She would definitely fight for that second bell though. I need to have that second bell, Naruto is going to get one for sure. But it's not because I want to be on a team with him or anything, I just don't want to go through the academy again. Yeah, that's right. Bull Satsuki was having an internal debate as to the her intentions of wanting the bells, Yakumo was having a similar one. Naruto is most definitely getting a bell, I would really like the second one though. It would be nice being on a team with someone as reliable as him if Hess is skilled as what I saw. But that's not saying Satsuki isn't reliable either. However, their inner thoughts were broken by Anko, who revealed the true reason behind the test. That's true, but the real reason for this test was to test your ability to work as a team. At first, you all were going to fail. But with that little stunt at the end, I can see that you all have a future as a pretty powerful squad if we can work out the kinks. So yeah, Team 12 is official. As the words left her mouth, Satsuki and Yukumo revealed a dazzling smile, while as Anko gave them all a grin. As they turned to the only male member of their team, to their complete shock and awe, he had a small smirk on his face, though it vanished quickly. Satsuki and Yukumo quickly turned their heads away, cheeks flushed, while Anko revealed a predatory grin. Well, well, well. Looks like things are going to be interesting after all. A few hours after the final genin exams were concluded, Minato as well as the Jinin who proctored the exams were discussing the results of the tests. Well, how did the genin perform on their tests everyone? Getting mixed responses from the Jinin, Minato decided to call them an order of team number to give their reports. Most of them were able to pass, but a few failed due to conflicts within the team, which caused them to fail in working as a team. Team 7 passes Minato-sensei, but that's to be expected as they're all siblings and know each other pretty well. Kakashi gave his report, happy that his team passed. Getting a smile and nod from Minato, he continued with the reports. 
the mate passes as well Minato-sama, though Kiba Inuzuka is trying to assert himself as the alpha of the team. He'll have to work on getting him out of a pack Minsid. Kurunai reported, confident that her team will become a strong one in the future. Minato also was pleased, he knew how the Inuzuka clan operated on a similar level to how a pack of wolves operated, so Kiba was only doing what his clan did. Team 10 also passes Minato-sama, though the new Ino Shikacho seem out of balance. Shikamaru and Choji get along great, but Ino isn't trying at all to get to know them or work with them at all. Shikamaru needed to appeal to her pride in order to get her to work with them, hopefully she breaks out of it. Asuma reported, concerned about the future of his team due to the blonde. Minato could only laugh wryly, knowing how Inoichi's daughter was absolutely obsessed with his son Menma. Hopefully Shed get into the Kinoichi Minsit soon though. Team 11 has passed as well Minato-sama, however they are not exactly team material. Sasuke Chiha shows no aptitude for teamwork, opting to work alone. Adding on to that, he doesn't try to associate with his teammates at all, even when they were struggling to pass my test. Sakura Hirono is the exact opposite to Sasuke, all she is trying to do is to get him to agree to go on a date with her. While this won't be normally a problem, she seems obsessed with him, to the point where Sai badmint him, she slugged him across the face. That brings me to Sai, has different. I don't know, but I get the feeling that he isn't a genin, has far too perceptive to be. After about half an hour, he got his teammates together and immediately told them about how teamwork was the key to the test. I won't do anything now, but it'll keep you updated about him. Genma reported with a sigh, knowing that he'd have his work cut out for him in the future. Minato gave a sharp nod in response, Orochimaru also commented on this team, saying that they would either sink or swim, the team dynamic being somewhat similar to his own. But he did warn Minato to pay attention to Sai, as he had his suspicions about him as well. Team 12 also passed Hokage-sama. They were pretty good for a couple of rookies. Satsuki and Yakumo managed to bind me for a few seconds with their teamwork. But most the most surprising thing was Naruto. At that statement, everyone's attention was focused on Anko, Minato's eyes widened by her statement and asked if she could continue, which she did. Well it was just Jutsu, that kid is fast. And I mean fast. It estimate that in terms of pure speed, has at least low Jinin. But that's not all, he hits pretty flippin' hard too. Lifting the sleeves of her trench coat, Anko showed the light-colored bruises that spotted her arm. These were all from him, I'm not joking when I say he actually pushed me to start trying, the first move he made was a kick to the head, and I'm sure if I didn't dodge it, it'd be in the hospital with a concussion. At the end of her report, everyone in the room quieted. The supposed dead last of the academy managed to actually make the normally playful Anko try, that sent a shock through their systems, as well as curiosity as to what else he could have been hiding. Minato knew that he had to get to the bottom of that mystery when he got back home. Thank you everyone. For the genin who didn't pass, please notify them that they will be put on reserve until they are placed on a team that works for them alright. That's all I have, thank all of you for your reports and meet me tomorrow for your squad's first mission. Anko, could you stay behind please? I need to talk to you. With that he dismissed the Jinin, with the exception of Anko. What's up Hokage-sama? Anko asked, though she knew what he was probably going to ask about. It's not every day the son you everyone called a failure managed to single-handedly take on a Jinin, even if they weren't going at 100%. I'm sure you already know, but it's about Naruto. I wanted to know, since I know that Orochimaru asked you to monitor him for me, what do you think his mental state is? Do you think has a treat to the village? Please be honest with me. Minato asked in a slightly hesitant manner, before he believed that his son wasn't a threat to the village, but after hearing how he managed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the top ninja in his village, he needed to be sure. Not just as a father but as the Hokage. As of right now, I'm not sure Minato-sama. From what I've gathered, it doesn't seem like he hates the village, but I know he doesn't have any love for it either. Judging from his body language when he interacts with other people, he doesn't really pay attention to them, since he doesn't tense up or relax around any one person. He'll keep an eye out for him though. Anko reported, knowing that it meant a great deal to him. Receiving a smile and a thank you in return, she was dismissed. Leaning back in his chair, Minato could only hope that his son would be willing to talk to him about his abilities. He wasn't too hopeful, but right now it was his only choice in order to unravel one of the mysteries that shrouded Naruto. He was about to finish up the last stack of documents before he felt a pulse of Kashina's chakra from the seal in her wedding ring. Before the pen touched the desk, he was gone in the signature flash of yellow of his Horatian no Jutsu. Scene change Yuzumaki Namaka's compound. Chaos could be the only thing that described the Yuzumaki Namaka's compound if someone were to see it. Kashina had her back pressed firmly against the door, her threatening yet scared aura on full blast, causing her children to cower in fear of their now angry mother, though her oldest stood firm, the same blank expression on his face. As things were about to heat up, a flash of yellow gained the attention of everyone present in the room, a clear sign that their savior had arrived. 
When Minato arrived, he noticed two things. One, his wife had an aura he hadn't felt in ages, the last time he felt this aura was when a rouge ninja called her by her moniker of the red hot blooded habanero, things wearing pretty afterwards. The second thing that he noticed was that his son had a small backpack and suitcase in hand. His eyes widened as he immediately understood the severity of the situation, Naruto was moving out. Though he didn't remain shocked for long as he was snapped out of his stupor by his wife. Minato. Naruto's moving out. I need you to help me convince him to stay here. Kishina said frantically, tears starting to form at the corners of her eyes. Seeing his wife in such a state broke Minato's heart, stealing his resolve and facing his son Minato tried to persuade his son to stay at the compound. Naruto, Minato spoke softly, why are you moving out? Your home is here with us. If space is what you want we can arrange that, we can find somewhere on the compound for you to call your own place if you want. We still care about you regardless of what happened in the past, I don't know why we acted the way we did, but we're going to make it up to you, if you give us the chance Naruto. Just, please don't leave us. Don't leave your family. Minato said with a sad tone, the tears in his eyes, reflecting the sorrow in his heart. Ashina picked up where Minato left off, taking a shaky step towards her oldest, tears freely flowing from her eyes now. Neri-chan, you can't move out. You're only 13, where would you stay? How are you going to pay your rent with just a starting Genin's earnings from missions? Who will make sure that you are eating right? Please Neri-chan, don't leave us, please don't. Kashina was openly weeping now, holding on to her husband for support as she continued to plead her oldest son to stay. I know that we've been terrible parents to you, and I know that I've been a horrible mother. We've never showed you the love that you deserved or needed, but we're going to make it up to you. Just please give us another chance. Let us be your family again, please. Please let me be your Kachan again. Naruto's siblings stayed quiet throughout their parents, tearful pleas for their older brother to stay home with them. Narumi was opening crying like her mother, hiccuping a little as she cried. Nido was silently crying, furiously wiping away the tears in her eyes futilely as the more she wiped them away, the more would stream out. Menma was less expressive than his sisters, scoffing at his brother and turning his head to the side, but the slight quivering of his lips gave away the feeling deep in his heart. As his family was crying around in front of him, Naruto continued to stay quiet. Looking at all of them with his face still blank. The sorrowful atmosphere was amplified as the now sobbing Narumi clung onto her older brother and began pleading for him to stay as well. Narunai. Please don't go. I'm sorry for being a horrible little sister and not playing with you when we were little. I'm sorry for always taking your Raymond and not telling you. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. So please don't go, don't leave me behind. I want to be with you. Narumi cried into the chest of her brother as Mito also pleaded for him to stay. Naruto Nai, please don't go. I'm sorry for how I acted in the past, I'll do my best to be a better sister in the future, I promise. So please Naichin, please don't go. I don't want you to go. Mito begged, finally letting out a few hiccups of her own. Menma just turned towards his older brother and locked stares with him, that blank look in his brother's eyes making him snap. Just go you loser. Can't you see that you are nothing but a problem for us? If you were never here, Tusan, Kachan, Nido, and Narumi won't be crying. So do us all a favor and just get out already. I don't need a useless brother like you or do I want one. Yeah, I've never done anything that an older brother should do, so why bother wanting you to stay around? Just go. None of us need you. After his small rant, Menma looked away, his lip quivering much more as a few tears leaked out of his eyes. Finally, after hearing the members of his family speak from their hearts, Naruto removed Naramis' arms from him and proceeded towards the door, much to the horror and utter despair of his family. Near the entrance of the door, he proceeded to turn around and address his family as a whole. I've lived the majority of my life without any of you being a part of it, by now you all should know better than anyone else that I'm not a helpless child that needs to be coddled by his family. I learned to look out for myself by the time I turned five years old, that was eight years ago. For eight years I've lived without experiencing your love or attention, why would I need or even want it now? Whether you like it or not, I've already become my own person and I intend on living my own life outside of this house. You owe me that much at least. Naruto said, his eyes narrowing at the end into an ice-cold glare that actually made his family flinch. Finished with his statement, he turned around and began walking out the door as his family started to break down behind him. Stopping as he opened it, he spoke one last time before he departed to his new apartment. The family is supposed to love you unconditionally and care for you without having to be asked to. From what I've experienced all these years, you shouldn't be considered my family. We should just be people who share the same blood and that alone does not define a family. But I can't cut my ties with you, no matter how hard I try. Thank you for the things that you have done like providing me a bed to sleep on. I'll forgive you all for what you've done in the past because the past is the past and I live in the present, however don't expect a place in my heart. 
It be too painful for anyone to have place there anymore. Whispering the last part so only he heard it, Naruto turned around and gave them a small bow, then walked out of the Uzumaki Namika's compound, towards the edge of the of the village where his new home laid. As the door closed with a soft thud, Kishina immediately ran into her room and slammed the door, stifled sobbing could be heard through the door. Minato quickly chazzed after his wife, feeling the same emotions as she did flooding in his heart. Menma scoffed and quickly went to his room, wiping the tears from his eyes as he muttered something about his brother under his breath. Mido and Narumi were hugging each other for physical and emotional support as they continued to cry and hiccup. The two eventually going to their rooms as more stifled whimpers could be heard from the outside. Reaching her room, Kishina slammed and locked it behind her. Throwing herself on the bed, she continued to sob uncontrollably, the cold eyes of her son and his words cutting deeply into her heart. She heard Minato knocking on the door, begging her to let in him, to let him comfort her, but she knew it won't do a thing to ease her the pain in her heart at the moment. As the afternoon slowly turned into the evening, Minato had decided to give his wife her time to grieve as he returned to finish the small amount of paperwork he had left before returning. Waking up from her tear-induced nap, Kishina groggily looked around her room. Body felt numb for some reason, her heart feeling like a piece was missing from it. Tears threatening to spill from her eyes again, her gaze found its way towards the bookshelf. Slowly making her way over, she found what she was looking for her family's photo album. Shakily reaching for it, she took it off the shelf and opened it, tears flowing once more as the first picture in the album was of her whole family. Slowly tracing her fingers over Naruto's face, she turned continued through the book, stopping gazing at the photos of her oldest, when he still had his smile, a smile that had been forgotten over the years. Reaching the fifth birthday of her children she smiled once more as she gazed lovingly at the photo of her children, all smiling and hugging each other. But soon her fond memories returned to their guilty and sad state. After that photo, there were almost no more photos of Naruto in the rest of the album. Frantically flipping through the pages, she finally found one last photo of him, one that shattered what little hope she had in her son returning to her family. The final page of the album was another family photo of them in the living room without Naruto, but looking closer in the upper corner he was there, and he was casting them the same cold glare that he did earlier. Clutching the album close to her chest, Kishina returned to her bed and cried softly as she let herself slip into the memories of the past. That's where Minato found his wife, appearing in a flash of yellow beside her. Sadness seeping into his eyes, he got changed and lied down beside her and wrapped her in a tight embrace, whispering that everything will be okay and that they'll do their best to bring their son home. Responding to Minato's comforting words, Kishina snuggled deeper into her husband's embrace, dreaming of a smiling Naruto running towards her before giving her a love-filled hug. Im home Kachan. Scene changed Naruto's apartment. As the evening turned to night, Naruto had finished tidying up and furnishing his apartment. While it was rather far from the village's center, it was close to a normally unused training field, which would benefit him greatly in the future. After finishing with his apartment, Naruto took a much-needed shower, washing away the fatigue of the day, both physical and emotional. Changing and then laying down on his bed, he thought about what had happened over the past few hours. He had finally moved out of that house, told his family about how he really felt about them, and was now an independent shinobi of Konoha. Looking out of his window towards the night sky where the stars laid, he didn't know what to make of the future, but for now both the stars and his future seemed a little brighter than before. Time skip a few weeks later, scene change Hokage's tower. The past few weeks have been interesting for Naruto to say the least. After moving out of his family's house, he had been seeing and feeling the disappointed glares of some of the villagers, most likely having heard that he had left his house and left his family in tears. But he never let the looks affect him, had been through worse than a few nasty looks. He had bumped into his family over the past few weeks as well, Narumi latching onto him and begging him to come home every time she saw him. Nido tried to talk to him, but always ended up starting a conversation that ended up with her awkwardly apologizing and leaving Menma just glared and scoffed at him, then proceeded to berate him with his usual gang of friends about how weak and useless he was. Kishina would see him shopping in the market district and barrage him with questions about how he was doing, if he was eating right, if he was staying out of trouble, and above all else, she asked if he wanted to come home, which he politely answered and declined each time. Though, he always saw Minato when he was getting a mission either with his teamer individually and would be asked the exact same questions as he did from Kishina, which he politely answered and declined the offer of returning home. Speaking of his team, things were proceeding how one would expect it to with Anko Midarashi as a sensei. They were all being trained into the ground. Ikumo, due to her frail body, was having a hard time with the physical exercises. Anko made sure to check to see if she could was alright if she thought she was in danger, but she was beginning to get physically stronger to the joy of her parents and pride of Anko. Kurunai even said that she was beginning to lose her pale and weak complexion and gain a more lively and strong one which made her blush. 
Tsutsuki fared much better, but she too was being trained into the ground by their overzealous sensei, but she could see that she was becoming stronger much to her enjoyment. Her parents even commented that she was much more skilled than she had ever been before, even her brothers noticed. Itachi smiled at her and told her that she was growing well. Sasuke however glared at her, and she glared back, knowing that her brother was jealous of her growth. Naruto didn't seem that tired when training sessions were over, on particularly hard days, the most they had seen him exhausted was a little winded breathing, otherwise he was able to take on anything Anko threw at him. As for what they were being trained on, at first it was mostly team exercises, but due in part to the three actually working together cohesively, they eventually were able to take on multiple types of training like tracking, scouting, support, investigation, espionage, and assault after a week of team building. The past few weeks rotated between the six different topics which were beginning to make them a jack-of-all-trades sort of team, which Anko had been planning on making them, better to be safe, then sorry was her train of thought, as she wanted her squad to be prepared for anything that could happen in the future. Right now Team 12 was reporting on their 41st D-ranked mission, which astounded every other Jinin sensei. Instead of the usual two to five missions a week, Anko made her team complete a minimum of at least nine missions a week, her reason being I don't want to be stuck doing D-rank missions for more than a month which was now why she knew her genin were ready for their first C-ranked mission. Congratulations for another mission well done Team 12. I assume that you want another mission correct? Minato asked, handing the completed report to his assistant to be filed later. Satsuka's eye immediately started twitching as the thought of doing more chores made her lose her cool. Yakumo sighed, knowing that they'd be doing more manual labor in the coming hours. Naruto retained his blank look, but his eyes darkened a bit. Minato noticed the glint in Anko's eyes and immediately knew what kind of mission she was going to ask for. Be sure our Hokage-sama. I think my cute little genin are ready for their first C-rank mission. We've completed the minimum number of 30 D-rank missions and I know that they'll be able to handle it. As the words left Anko's mouth, Satsuka's eyes burned with the flames of determination within them. Yakumo's eyes widened in excitement as she straightened her back and put on a determined face. Naruto's face still remained blank, but there was a little excitement in his eyes. Seeing the look of determination and excitement on the faces of the genin, Minato could only sigh and relent, smiling he agreed. Yaw right Anko, your squad has gone above and beyond when completing your missions, so I think Yaw have earned this. Minato said with pride as he handed Anko a mission scroll. It's a simple escort mission, but I think your team will be able to handle it. Alyssa sent could you please let in Tazuna san Turning towards the door, Minato called out to the secretary to let in their client. The door soon opened to reveal a grey-haired, bespectacled man. As soon as he reached them he turned and gave them his evaluation of them. I thought I paid to hire a team to escort me, not two girls, a boy, and a scantily woman. I bet those three kids haven't even touched a weapon and that woman hasn't been in a real fight. Tazuna said as he took a gulp from a small bottle of sake. Tsutsuki scowled as Anko and Yakumo frowned, definitely not liking how he was implying that women were weak. Naruto didn't react, but he did clench his hand slightly. But the four things could escalate, Minato immediately narrowed his eyes and raised his voice at Tazuna. Tazuna-san, I would appreciate it if you don't insult the people that will be escorting you. The ninja before you are more than capable of protecting you, Anko is one of my top kinoichi, being an ex-Anbu captain. At that information Tazuna, Satsuki, and Yakumo looked shocked. Tazuna because he had someone of such caliber protecting him and Yakumo and Satsuki because they didn't know that their sensei held such a prestigious position. Naruto's eyes widened slightly, but he knew she was much stronger than she was leading on. At all the attention she was getting, Anko couldn't help but blush slightly. Geez, if you keep staring at me like that I'm gonna blush. She said with a grin, rubbing the back of her head in embarrassment. Eventually the tense atmosphere before returned to a tranquil one, Anko directing her genin. Alright my cute little genin, we're meeting tomorrow at the main gate and head towards Nami no Kuni, Land of Waves, then alright. From the mission details, we're going to be escorting and guarding Tazuna-san while the wave complete a bridge. So pack enough supplies for at least a month to be safe all right. After her instructions, her genin nodded and they were all dismissed. As Naruto walked out of his office, Minato quickly called out to him. Stopping near the door, Naruto turned around slightly to face him. Naruto, please be safe out there okay. Expecting him to be ignored, Minato was surprised and overjoyed that his son actually responded to him. I will be, thank you for your concern Minato-san. Naruto said before he bowed and exited the room, leaving Minato to smile slightly before he returned to his paperwork. The next day, Team 12 had all assembled at the main gate. On gate duty that day, Chikninazumo Kamazuki and Katetsu Hagein couldn't help but smile and light lightly at the excited faces of the genin waiting at the gate. Yakumo had her eyes closed with an excited smile on her face as she hummed a little tune to herself. 
Tsutsuki was shaking a little in apprehension and excitement, her lips quivering from trying to stop herself from smiling too much. While Naruto looked at the forest through the gate with a blank expression, a tiny spark of excitement in his eyes. After a few minutes Tazuna arrived followed by Anko, who after seeing the looks of her genin, couldn't help but smile. Well looks like the three of you are excited to leave on this mission huh? Well let's get to it then. As she gave her orders, she received a unanimous high. From her genin as they headed towards Nami no Kuni. As Team 12 headed towards Nami no Kuni, Anko noticed that Tazuna looked more tense than an escort client should be, it was almost as if he was marked for death. Then she noticed a large puddle ahead and narrowed her eyes. A puddle that big, even if it rained recently it won't be that big. Definitely has to be Jinjutsu. But maybe this'll be a good test to see how they handle a situation under pressure. If things start to turn, he'll step in. After making the decision of letting her team handle things, Anko walked on the puddle as chains wrapped around her and ripped her to pieces, to the horror of her genin and Tazuna. The chains retracted as two cloaked figures charged at the group, claw-like gauntlets raised to strike. One down. One of the cloaked figures said as they approached the group. Tsutsuki froze, she thought her sensei was one of the best in the village, if she got taken down what good would she be? Swallowing her fear, she dodged the cloaked figure with straight hair as they lunged at her with his gauntlet. Ikumo seeing Satsuki in trouble, immediately threw a volley of shuriken at the person attacking her, managing to get her attention long enough for Satsuki to kick them away as she threw her own shuriken. While Satsuki and Yakumo were occupied with one of the cloaked figures, the other one with unruly hair charged him and Tazuna. Tazuna was scared, he had seen an ex-Anbu captain get ripped to pieces and now he was going to see a couple of kids get killed before he died. The girls were managing to hold off one of them, but the blonde alone wasn't going to hold off the other one. As the other attack approached Azuna Cold and only watch in shock and awe as the blonde-headed kid actually stopped them. Maizu Cold believed was just happened, a kid stopped his attack with just a kunai. A kunai against his gauntlet. But he responded as he felt pain erupt on the right side of his body. As Maizu lunged at him, Naruto whipped out a kunai in a reverse grip, letting the gauntlet of his opponent glide across the blade of his kunai, Naruto deflecting the attack to the left side of his body, and judging from the shock of his opponent, he didn't expect that to happen. Oh well, Naruto thought as he retaliated, spinning and connecting his elbow to the left side Maizu's body, a sickening snap echoing across the road as Maizu fell to the ground gasping for breath and clutching the side of his body. However, Naruto didn't his assault as he turned around and stuck the back of Maizu's head, his opponent's head impacting the ground with a dull thud as he remained motionless. Mzu cold and believe his eyes when he saw his older brother hit the ground, holding his side. He didn't expect the kid to be skilled enough to handle his brother, let alone beat him. But his distraction cost him as a kick connected to his stomach, making him gasp for air. But he found himself unable to take a breath, as if there was no air for him to breathe, panicking and disoriented, he slowly lost conciseness as his world turned black. As Naruto finished dealing with his opponent, Yakumo had finished the signs to her jutsu, as Satsuki managed to land a kick to Mzu's midsection. Staring right at Mzu, Yakumo whispered Batsuraku Ga's no jutsu. Seeing her opponent's look of shock as they tried to take a breath, Yakumo knew that it had worked. As Satsuki was about to strike again, she saw her opponent trying to take a breath and knew that it was Yakumo's jutsu at work. Sighing, the two were about to relax before they remembered the other one. Snapping their heads back towards their teammate, their jaws dropped as they saw him tying the other assailant up, the same blank expression on his face. To say Anko was shocked would be an understatement, not only had her team managed to hold off enemy ninja, they managed to hold their own against two Chknin ranked opponents. While we was extremely impressed with Satsuki and Yakumo's incredible teamwork, she was at a loss for words when she saw how efficiently and brutally Naruto took down his opponent. That elbow had to have broken a rib or two, and that blow to the back of the head, alongside how hard the impact was, there was no doubt that he had some serious injuries. While Satsuki and Yakumo had a little trouble dealing with Gazm that was expected, they are still genin. But Naruto dismantled Maizu like he was nothing. Just how strong is this kid? Breaking out of her thoughts, Anko dropped down to the shock of everyone but Naruto, which she took note of. That was amazing. Looks like my cute little genin really can handle themselves in the big bad world. Anko said grinning, explaining how she used Kawarimi to substitute herself with a long in order to assess how they performed against live opponents and that they exceed her expectations. Hearing praises from their sensei, Yakumo and Satsuki revealed bashful faces and smiles as they couldn't say anything in response to Anko's praises. Naruto's blank look remained, but a hint of happiness could be seen in his eyes. But the peaceful moment was broken when Anko turned to Tazuna and addressed the situation. Look here Tazuna-san, I know that this has definitely escalated from a C-rank escort mission. You mind telling me why we were attacked by the Demon Brothers when we're just supposed to be escorting you? Anko said, a scary and angry glint in her eyes at the audacity of the man to put her genin in danger. 
the Zuna almost immediately went down to his knees and begged them to help him. Telling them about the situation with Nami no Kuni about how a crime lord, Gato, has taken over and practically ruled the small village with an iron fist. That a C-rank mission was the most that they could afford with the allotted funds from the few villagers who had extra to spare. As he finished he pleaded with them again to help him that they would repay them in the future when the wave was back on its feet. Anko heard the sob story and cold help but feel pity towards the man and his village. According to Code, she was to abandon the mission and report to Zuna to Minato and have his name blacklisted as requesting a false mission. Deciding that she cold make this decision alone and that it was her Jenin's first time outside of the village she asked them. Well, you all heard his story. What do you think we should do? Remember, it's okay to not want to continue, it's a dangerous mission. Anko asked, her teasing voice unusually gentle. She didn't get an answer from Yakumo or Satsuki, the two girls looking at their feet. She didn't blame them, they had heard that Gato kidnapped women and girls and forced them into the entertainment business. But she received a response from the least vocal of the team, but the response wasn't one she or anyone else was expecting from him. Anko sensei We are going on this mission. We're going to escort Izuna Santanami no Kuni and Hess going to complete that bridge. Then, I'm going to find every one of Gato's thugs and tear their throats out. Finally, I'm going find Gato himself and rip his head off. Naruto started out quietly, but near the end he raised his voice as his eyes burned with so much fury that they were a little shaken by it. But as quickly as it came, it left, his blank face returning, though they could tell how he felt from the small scowl now on his face. While she was shaken at him at first, Satsuki steadied her resolved and agreed with her teammate, though not about the killing part. Yakumo followed suit, knowing that it would be dangerous and that she could become a liability given her condition, but steeled her resolve. Anko, seeing the now determined faces of her genin, could only smile at them for wanting to help Tazuna, though she was a little scared of Naruto's proclamation, he wasn't actually going to kill anyone, was he? The team coming to an agreement before him to help him and his people, Tazuna could only bow his head lower and mutter thank you, over and over again, tears streaming down his face. After their vote, the group continued on their way towards Nami no Kuni, finally reaching a checkpoint at a friend of Tazuna who lent them a boat. After the boat ride, they proceeded on their way, only in about an hour and a half from Tazuna's homeland. As they continued down the worn road, Anko began to feel as though someone was following them, but she cold pointed out. On guard but figuring it was because she was in unknown territory, she ignored it. But soon the lull of the moment was broken when Naruto threw a kunai at a bush, a small white rabbit scurrying out of it. What are you doing you idiot? You almost gave me a heart attack. Satsuki shouted at her teammate, patting herself over the chest. Her adrenaline returning for another encounter like earlier before. Naruto, please be more careful. You really scared me there, I thought it was another enemy. Even the polite Ikumo scolded him, imitating the action of her female teammate by patting her chest in relief. But the moment was immediately tense as Anko shouted at them to get down. Get down. Forcing Tazuna onto the ground as her genin quickly followed her order, a large blade soared overhead and embedded itself in the trunk of a tree behind them. Well, well, well. So you were able to dodge my kubik rubbish, may. Guess you weren't as bad as you look. A mocking voice said as they turned around to see a figure standing on the handle of the blade before jumping down and taking it out of its resting place and putting it on his shoulder. Anko immediately narrowed her eyes, her body tense, ready to take action. Zabuza Mamachi, the demon of the hidden mist. What are you doing here? Anko questioned, hoping that her wasn't here for Tizuna. But her fears were immediately answered as he let out a mocking laugh. Well, I didn't expect to find the snake mistress of Kanoha here. What do you think I'm here for? I'm here for the old man behind you, so why don't you do you and your little brats a favor and just hand him over? I won't kill you if you do. The man now known as Abusa said. Sorry, but I can't do that. Mission is to protect him after all. Anko said, whipping out a kunai in preparation of the impending conflict. As Abusa chuckled again. Mission? You expect me to believe a couple of brats like that are capable of taking on a mission like this already? I doubt they're even ready for dear rank mission let alone this. He taunted, which worked as Itsuki growled, Yakumo glared, and Naruto actually narrowed his eyes at him. Anko didn't take too kindly to someone other than herself taunting her genin. But fine, we'll do this the hard and fun way. Zabuza said, raising his arms in seal before calling out a jutsu that made Anko drop a bead of sweat down the side of her face. Suiten. Kuridakur no jutsu, as a thick mist began to roll into the shock of the genin. As the mist rolled in, the three began to feel a thickness in the air, as if it was getting much harder to breathe. Tsutsuki was trembling, the kunai she had taken out was shaking in her hand. Her whole being screamed at her to run away, to get somewhere safe, but she cold move. All she could do was stand there shaking like a leaf in the wind. Wow what is this? The air is so thick, I can't even breathe. It's like I'm in a pool of water right now. I'm scared. I'm really scared. 
am I going to die? Tsutsuki thought as she frantically looked within her field of view, unable to even turn her head due to the overwhelming killing intent. Ikumo was on her knees, her already frail body unable to take the killing intent directed at her. The kunai that she originally held in one hand was now held in both, shaking just like her body. She wasn't prepared for this, she expected another quick fight but not this. She didn't want to be here, she wanted to take everyone and run, but she couldn't even move a finger in this situation. We need to get out of here. We're not going to make it if we fight this man, I don't even think Anko-sensei can beat him in this mist. I want to get everyone and run, but I can't. I'm scared. I'm really scared. I'm going to die rent I. Yakumo thought as she stared into the mist before her, unable to vocalize any of her thoughts or actions from the killing intent Zabuza was emitting. While his two teammates were having a hard time due to the killing intent directed at them, Naruto was faring much better, having been exposed to far worse from Ryuhei. Though that didn't shake all his apprehension off as the slight shaking of his hand was an indicator that he was nervous. So this is what Ryu Naichin meant when he said that it was a technique used by practically every ninja out there. I need to be careful, one wrong move and I'm dead. Naruto was broken out of his thoughts when Anko stood firm before them. Tsutsuki, Yakumo, Naruto. Don't panic, I don't let my comrades die, especially when they're people I care about. Anko shouted, trying to lift the effects of the killing intent from her genin, and it worked as they all visibly stopped shaking violently. Satsuki tightening her grip on her kunai. Yakumo shakily standing up before getting into a stance with her kunai. Naruto relaxed and slipped into a stance, his eyes now hard and sharp. After her speech, Zabuza laughed again before appearing in the middle of Naruto, Satsuki, Yakumo, and Tazuna. To their shock and horror. Nice speech, too bad you are all dead. He said as he brought Kubikarabjim around to slash through the floor, but as he did Anko appeared next to him and stabbed him through in the midsection to his shock. Don't you ever try to lay your dirty hands on my genin. Anko glared at him with unbridled fury in her eyes. But to their surprise, he turned into a puddle of water. Anko sensei. Behind you. Yakumo screamed, seeing another Zabuza appear behind her. To their horror, Anko was cut down by Zabuza. But to his shock, the Anko he cut turned to mud as it hit the ground. As he felt cold steel against his neck. The hour finished. Anko said in a cold voice, her eyes narrowed in anger. But to her surprise and the surprise of everyone else, she started to chuckle lightly. You prepared a Doro Bunshin when I made the miss, didn't you? That's pretty clever, it'll give you that. But I'm finished. You don't understand who you are facing, do you? After saying that, Zabuza dispersed into another puddle of water and reappeared behind her, Kubikrabjman swing to cleave her in half. Ducking, Anko managed to evade being cut in half, but using his momentum Zabuza spun around and kicked her in the side, sending her to the large lake that laid next to them. You just sealed the death of you, the old man, and your little one of ninjas. Zabuza said, rushing to the area where Anko had landed. Anko sensei. Satsuki shouted, her eyes wide in shock at what just happened. Her sensei had just been kicked into a lake, from what she had seen he used suetin, which meant he had the advantage in the water. Sensei. Yakumo screamed, seeing her sensei get kicked into a lake. If she was in the lake then that meant that Zabuza had the advantage if he knew more suetin jutsu, which from her sensei's battle, he probably did. Naruto's eyes widened before they narrowed again. This isn't good at all. Sensei has zero chance now that Hess got her in that lake. Expression similar thoughts as his teammates at the situation now at hand. Wah, what hell. Why the is this water so damn heavy? Anko said, breaking the surface of the lake only to see Zabuza's shadow next to her, turning around her eyes widened as she saw him finish a series of hand seals. You were stupid to let me get you into the lake, but you made a dumber mistake by trying to get out of it. Suetin. Surum no jutsu. Zabuza shouted as he encased Anko in a sphere of water. Can't move can you? That water's denser due to my charka flowing through it, you are not getting out of there. Shit. Hess a lot stronger than I thought, I should've known better than to have Ing underestimated him. Anko angrily thought, her overconfidence was going to cost her own life, the life of Tizuna, but worst of all, it was going to cost her the lives of her genin. Turning toward stunned genin, Zabuza could only stare mockingly at them before he created another water clone, using the Mizubunshin no jutsu from earlier. Look at you all shaking and scared now that you lost your sensei. Where is that bravado from earlier, especially you blondie, I didn't notice you shaking before, absolutely pathetic. A real ninja is one who can survive even in the face of death, and let me tell you a little secret, I have. Putting emphasis on the last two words, Zabuza proceeded to tell him of his exam to become a shinobi. In the bloody mist, the genin selection exam involved you killing the classmates and friends that you grew up, ate, and played with. It was a test that truly showed who was the strongest. Now imagine a kid who wasn't even part of that exam showing up and killing over 100 of those weaklings. Those were good times. At his story, Satsuki and Yakumo turned a sickly green at the thought of that massacre. 
As he finished, the clone he created vanished and reappeared in front of Naruto to everyone's shock and sent him flying with a kick to the head, knocking his headband off in the process. Good like your way in over your heads, you know what you are. His clone started as he walked towards the group. You're just a bunch of immature, weak, scared, little brats. Run. You guys can't win, just take Tazuna and run and save yourselves. He can't move while Hess holding me here and his clones can't move too far from the original. Anko screamed hysterically as she was about to witness the deaths of her genin right before her eyes. As the clone approached slowly, Satsuki, Yakumo, and Tazuna had their lives flash before their eyes as they closed them. Tazuna remembered his family and the wave, their smiles and hopes all placed on him to complete the bridge. Satsuki remembered her family, her mother and father's smiles, her other brother's forehead pokes, and her twin smirk. Then she saw all the times she had with her team, the missions, the training, but she also saw a head of blonde hair and a handsome smile directed towards her, instead of his usual blank face. Ikumo remembered her mother and father smiling at her, the sealing of the Ido by Kishina and Minato. The time she spent with Kurinai and training with her. Then she saw her team, with all the missions and training sessions that they had together, but then she saw a familiar head of blonde hair, but instead of a blank face, this blonde gave her a charming smile. As they began to accept the fact that they were going to die, a thud and splash could be heard which made them snap their eyes open. Standing in front of them wasn't a blank-faced Naruto, but a Naruto with his eyes narrowed in anger with a scowl on his face. That hurt, but I guess I don't have to hold back, huh? He said as his scowl slowly turned into a smirk. Biting the thumb on his left hand and quickly swiping the blood into the palm of his hand, a cloud of smoke cover him from the views of everyone present. As it cleared everyone present had their jaws drop at what they saw. Naruto was standing in the same position with his eyes closed, but with a huge sword at least six feet long and a one foot wide, resting on his shoulder. Turning his head slightly so that he faced Tabuza, he slowly opened his eyes. His navy blue eyes were now electric blue, his round pupil was now reptilian in shape. His blank face slowly turned into a predatory smile as he uttered a few words that made Zabuza sweat slightly. Him a little different from most immature brats. Silence dominated the battlefield as Naruto stood defiantly against a stunned Zabuza. Not only had he destroyed his Mizubunshin without trouble, but after that cloud of smoke dispersed, he was different than before. Before he was a blank-faced, navy-eyed brat. But now he had electric blue eyes, a giant sword that he swore he knew from somewhere, and a predatory smile on his face, though he was still a brat. Though, that wasn't what caused Zabuza to break a sweat, what did was the aura of sheer confidence and dominance that he now emitted. Anko was in complete shock at the changes in her student, the blank-faced boy she had gotten fond of had now a completely different personality. His presence reminded her of someone, but she couldn't think of who it was, but she did know one thing. For some reason, she had strange feeling of confidence in him and knew that he'd be able to get them out of this mess. Though, it could be because he was holding a sword that was bigger than he was. Azuna was in awe of the boy that stood in front of him, from what he had seen before with the demon brothers he was dependable, being able to deal with one of them easily. But now, he had the sneaking suspicion that he would even be able to take on Zabuza and actually win as crazy as it seemed. He could only hope that his suspicions were true as if they weren't, they'd be as good as dead. Tsutsuki had her jaw gaping at the scene. The dead last of the academy, her stupid teammate, and the same guy who she had been working with for the past month, had completely changed the personality that she had grown used to seeing. Standing before her wasn't a blank-faced blonde, but a blonde who gave off a powerful aura. She didn't know why, but she actually believed that he could beat Tsubusa. Ikumo couldn't believe her eyes, what had happened to her blonde teammate. He was always so calm and collected, but now it seemed like he was ready to run wild. She had never felt such confidence from anyone in her life, and that made her feel safe and secure. She knew that deep in her heart, Naruto would beat Zabuza and save them all from the situation that they found themselves in. However, the standoff was broken when Zabuza knew that this was no time to be thinking about what ifs of the brat, quickly making more clones, he sent them to get rid of him before he could do anything else. Seeing Zabuza create more clones and send them to attack, Naruto quickly lost his smile, and his eyes narrowed as he rushed in to intercept them before they reached shore. To everyone's complete shock, he started running across the water similar to Zabuza's clones, reaching the first one before they reached land. The clone responded with a downward slash, which Naruto avoided, taking a step to the right and spinning, using the momentum gained to slash through the clone Kubikurumjum and its wielder with ease. Not easing up, he rushed through the remaining clones, hacking and dodging his way through them before he finally finished dealing with them, turning his attention towards the original Ananko. Zabuza wasn't just surprised, he was outright stunned. A boy at least half his age was using a sword that huge with such grace and skill, it just wasn't possible. But at the same time, a feeling that he thought had died long ago began to surface after almost a decade, for the first time in a number of years, Zabuza actually felt excited at the prospect of fighting another person. 
he was broken out of his thoughts when Naruto started to run towards him, his sword trailing behind in his right hand. DSK, looks like I don't have a choice. Zabuza whispered, removing his hand from his surum no jutsu, he grabbed Kubikurum and charged Naruto. Leaving Anko to drop back into the water and take large gulps of precious air. Seeing Zabuza release his sensei, Naruto mentally breathed a sigh of relief that was one problem dealt with and the other was headed right towards him. Tightening his grip on his basset's no, he swung and met Zabuza's Kubikurum head on, a deafening clang and shower of sparks flying as the two blades met each other. Grunting as he was being easily overpowered by the larger man, Naruto shifted his sword slightly and managed to throw Kubikurum slightly off balance, sidestepping Naruto spun around and slashed horizontally in an attempt to at least break Zabuza's guard a little bit. Feeling his balance shift slightly due to the Brad angling his sword slightly, saw him spin around like he did earlier, probably trying to break through Kubikurum like with the clone. Smirking under his bandages, he had to admit that if he was using a regular sword, that wolf worked, but unfortunately for the brat, he had Kubikurum. Tightening his grip on his sword and bracing himself for the attack, Zabuza took the full brunt of Naruto's swing, his arms buckled a little bit from the power of it, but it didn't even come close to the power of Kisum's monster swings. Naruto's eyes went wide, he had at least expected Zabuza to take a step back or something, but he didn't expect him to shrug off his swing like it was nothing. His momentary distraction was exploited as Zabuza kicked him in the gut, making him stumble back a few feet before his roll to the side to avoid the overhead swing from Zabuza. Riding himself, Naruto was about to rush towards Zabuza again when he noticed his sensei running towards them, her hands a blur as she prepared a jutsu. Satsuki and Yakuma were also preparing their own jutsu as they ran towards the shoreline of the lake and took aim. Zabuza noticed as well if the tensing of his body and darkening of his eyes were any indication. DSK. Figured he won't be fighting fair. I almost forgot that we're not just swordsmen. We're also shinobi and we don't fight fair. Just when he was starting to get into this duel, he remembered that they weren't just swordsmen, but were ninja as well. One on one and honor didn't exist in this world, figured the brat was just stalling for time for his team to get the jump on him. But he didn't expect what happened next and neither did anyone else. Anko sensei Satsuki, Yakumo, stop. Naruto shouted at his team, making them flinch and stop in the midst of their seals. What do you mean stop? you are seriously not expecting me to just wait and do nothing while he butchers you. We've got the advantage now and I'm not going to let it go to waste. Anko shouted back. The hell was he thinking, they had the advantage now that it was two on one, especially now that she wasn't going to underestimate him anymore. Yeah you idiot. You think you can take on someone like him on your own, are you insane, Satsuki screamed at him, her eyes burning in anger. We're not going to let you get killed just because you think you are going to win. Naruto, we're a team. We fight together, that why we're not going to just sit back and watch. Yakumo yelled at him, her usually calm face now slightly angry and determined. But the words from their teammate that followed made everyone present gawk. That's true, and if we were fighting other ninja it'd agree with you. But that's not the situation anymore. This turned into a duel between swordsmen the moment his sword met mine. Have you guys noticed that he hasn't used a single Mizubunshin or Suitin Jutsu, even though I'm on the water, his playing field. He cold crushed me if he decided to use a wide-scale Jutsu, but he didn't. He probably did it unconsciously, but he has agreed this duel as well. Isn't that right Zabuza-san? Naruto said, never taking his eyes of Zabuza as he tightened the grip on his sword. Again, this brat at him stunned. Was he suicidal or just plain insane? A duel with him. One of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist. Though, he had to admit, he gained a very tiny grain of respect for the brat. Not many still upheld the honor that came with a duel anymore, himself included. But he had to admit, he actually kind of wanted to see what the brat was made of. If he knew about the honor and code of a duel, what were his skills like? From what has seen, he wasn't too green. Finally, he did something that unnerved everyone there, he laughed. It wasn't the condescending or dark laugh from earlier, but an actual humor-filled one. Are you insane or just plain suicidal brat? You are openly challenging one of the strongest seven ninja swordsmen of the mist. Even with your sensei, you too won't even land a scratch me. Zabuza barked out, his eyes never leaving the blonde in front of him, as he also tightened his grip on Kubikurum. What came next out of Naruto's mouth was something that he just cold forgive. Don't you mean former seven ninja swordsmen of the mist old man? From what I've seen, you've lost your skill as a swordsman. Guess laying around doing nothing for a few years will do that to you. Naruto snidely said, sneering at Zabuza as tick marks began to pop up on his head. Oh, yowring dead brat and for the record I am, not that old. I am only 26. Zabuza yelled, rage boiling in his eyes as he charged at Naruto. Naruto winced as his plan to anger Zabuza worked probably too well, 
bringing his Basset Sando up to block the blow from Zabuza as a shower of spark rained down on him. His arms buckled under the sheer power of Zabuza's swing as he made a mental note to himself. Note to self. Try not to anger a former master swordsman during a duel by commenting on their age. They continued clashing against each other, sparks flying each time their blades met. As he saw a diagonal slash from Zabuza, Naruto misjudged the timing of his dodge, Zabuza landing a clean cut on his shoulder. The favor was returned when they collided once more, Naruto angling and pushing his Basset Sando off against Kubikurabj, managing to land a cut on Zabuza's cheek. Eventually, Naruto started to slow down the heavy blows from Zabuza, making his arms go more and more numb with each swing. Swinging his sword and overhead in a wide arc, Zabuza's Kubikurabj met Naruto's Basset Sando with a loud clang and explosion of sparks. Angling his sword again then pushing against Kubikurabj once more, Naruto threw Zabuza off balance slightly as he swung towards him, but met air as Zabuza ducked under his swing. Spinning around Zabuza swung horizontally to bisect Naruto, but hit his sword instead, sending the blonde flying a short distance from the power of his swing. Smirking a bit, Zabuza changed his stance as Naruto staggered to his feet, setting up an unstable guard with his Basset Sando. Setting his feet diagonally shoulder length apart, his right foot outstretched and Kubikurabjim held in a reverse grip perpendicular to his body behind him, Zabuza performed a move he hasn't used since his time as a part of Kira's military force. Kubikurabjim. Riaisawari. Naruto barely saw him move as Zabuza appeared behind him, sending him flying from the monstrous power of his attack. Hitting the water and skipping a few feet, he managed to regain his balance and right himself in the air. His eyes widened as he saw the aftereffect of Zabuza's attack. A scar in the water ran from where Zabuza stood to where he was before his attack, at least seven to nine feet long, a foot wide and two feet deep. Not bad brat, you are actually still alive. I must be getting rusty if you lived through that, nobody's seen that and lived to admire it like you are doing right now. Zabuza praised slightly, though he was discontent with the lack of power in his attack, he was rusty, and he didn't like that. Naruto stood up shakily, his stamina beginning to run out. He was covered in cuts, the largest one on being on the back of his right shoulder, from misreading the timing of one of his dodges. Compared to him, Zabuza had only superficial cuts, his most major one being on a small cut on his check from getting knocked off balance earlier. Shooting a quick glance to the side, Naruto could tell his teammates and Sensei's self-control were quickly slipping from the glares they were directing at Zabuza. He needed to finish this quickly before they interrupted them slipping into a stance similar to Zabuza's before. He got a raised eyebrow from the taller man. Looks like you are intending on finishing this huh? Fine brat, ill humor you. He said, getting into the same stance as before. We end things in this final attack alright Zabuza-san. I win, you let us go. You win, you can kill me, but let please let my team and Tazuna-san go. Naruto said, staring straight at Zabuza, his eyes hard and narrowed. You really think you should be bargaining in your position? He'll think about it, but you have zero chance of winning Brad. Zabuza replied, tightening his grip on his sword as he narrowed and focused his eyes on Naruto. Silence reigned over the lake as no one dared to take a breath during the tense moment. Finally, as if they were waiting for it, a leaf dropped onto the lake and the two charged each other. Kubikurabjim. Riaisawari. Asset Sando. Jishin Jiri. Faster than their eyes could follow, excluding Anko, the final strikes of Naruto and Zabuza ended. The water between them ripped three feet across, five feet deep, and twelve feet long, slowly began to fill back in, causing turbulent waves to form. Naruto's eyes widened as he coughed up blood as a cut appeared from his left shoulder going diagonally downwards, ending near his hip. Dropping his basset snow, it disappeared in a large wisp of black smoke before hitting the water. His world started to go black as he saw Anko sprinting towards him, he managed to mutter one word before losing consciousness. How? Zabuza stood firm before he coughed up some blood, staining the bandages over his mouth. If he turned around, they all would see that he had a horizontal gash across his body. The deepest cut was on his right bicep which was cut halfway to the bone, which ran across his chest to the other bicep. Smirking to himself, he heaved Kubikurabjim onto his shoulder with his left hand before he started to sway. Though, before he could fall, a masked figure in a kimono appeared next to him and leaned him onto their shoulder. Without waiting for a response from any of them, he vanished in a swirl of mist. After Anko brought Naruto back to the shore of the lake, she was met with a teary-eyed Yakumo and Satsuki, who asked if he was all right. To everyone's relief, the cut he received was wasn't life-threatening, the deepest part being near his shoulder was halfway towards cutting the bone, which Anko took care of quickly. Scene change unknown place. The masked figure that Adzabuza held close gently put him down as they started tending to his injuries. After a few seconds, Zabuza snapped his eyes open, locking his gaze on the person treating him. Ugh Haku, that you? He asked, slightly disorientated from the blood loss. Yes Abusa-sama, it's me. I'm sorry that I let you get this injured. 
I should stop that shinobi when I had the chance. Haku solemnly said in a feminine tone, removing the mask on their face to reveal a beautiful yet sad face. She expected to get yelled at for failing to protect him, but she got yelled at for a completely different reason. Are you an idiot? That was a one-on-one -on -one duel between that brat and me. If you had interfered, I would cut you down for tarnishing my name as a swordsman. I don't have much left, but that brat reminded me that I still do have my reputation as a swordsman. He said in a stern tone, as he started checking over his injuries, being actually surprised at the damage that he sustained. Damn, that brat wasn't half bad. If I had been a little slower I would've lost my arm. Guess he wasn't bluffing when he said he was different from the other brats. He was broken out of his assessment by Haku who reminded him to be careful. Zabuza sama, please don't strain yourself. Next time, he'll take care of that boy. You focus on recovering your strength, Gato said that in the case that we fail to eliminate the target, we'll gather and eliminate them within the coming week or two. Haku said, but once again was surprised by her master's words. You don't get it do you Haku, that brat is mine and mine alone. You take care of his sensei and those other brats, but me and him have a duel to finish next time. We'll give them until the day that sleazeball decides to attack to recover. After hearing her master's orders, Haku nodded and returned to tending his wounds as Abusa thought back to duel. That kid has good, has really good. The only reason it turned out like this was because Hess inexperienced and him rusty. He, Hess gonna be a monster in the future. Time skipped two hours later, scene changed Nami no Kuni. After their brush with death, the group finally made it to Tazuna's house. As they approached the house, a relatively young woman with dark hair stepped out of the house, and as soon as she turned her head and saw the group, namely Tazuna, she started to tear up before running and giving the man a hug. Father. You're all right. I was so worried, you said it would only take two days to come back. Why did it take you three? Are you hurt anywhere? The woman asked, frantically checking if Tazuna was injured anywhere. She received a chuckle in return as he hugged his daughter back. I'm fine, I'm fine tsunami. I was attacked, but these brave ninja protected me. Tazuna reassured his daughter as she turned and introduced herself and thanked them for protecting her father. Im Tsunami, thank you so much for protecting my father. Without him, the last hope for the wave would be lost. Tsunami said solemnly, knowing that his daughter would venture into more depressing memories, Tazuna opted to break the now saddened mood. Now Tsunami, just don't stand there. We have guests to our home, let's try and make them feel welcomed okay. Tazuna said with a bright smile on his face that was returned by his daughter. You're right father, everyone please do come right in. It's small, but it is home. We should have enough room for all of you to stay, so please don't be shy. Tsunami said with a smile as she led the group into the house. As they entered, they spotted a child with spiky black hair and eyes. Seeing the mentor, the child gave them a slightly angry look before Tsunami called out to him. Inari, say hello to these people. They are ninja who protected grandpa. Tsunami said with a gently and motherly tone as she smiled at her son. Though Inari ignored them as he headed up to his room. Seeing the reaction of the kid raised alarms in Anko's head, a kid his age shouldn't be looking like that, something big must happen with him. Quickly glancing around, she also noted that there weren't many pictures of Tsunami with someone who looked like her husband. Mentally, she made a note to herself about that. Well, looks like the situation is more drastic than we thought. Kid must had his dad either leave them or got killed by Gato's men. She assessed, as Tsunami apologized for her son's behavior, getting an understanding nod from the Kanoha ninja, seeing as the situation in Nami no Kuni must been harsh. Time skip one hour later, after they had all settled into Tsunami, Tazuna and Inra's home, Team 12 had one thing on their minds, that being Naruto. After Anko had finished treating him and Tsunami directed her as to where he was going to be sleeping, she had called Yakumo and Satsuki together for a team meeting. Anko-sensei just, just what is Naruto? Yakumo asked timidly, after being shouted at by her teammate to not interfere with the battle he had with Zabuza and seeing him somehow hold his own against him, hundreds of questions swam through her mind. Who really was their blonde teammate? The blank-faced but funny person they always saw. The angry and scary person who promised to kill Gato. The strong and confident person who fought against Zabuza. Just who was Naruto Uzumaki Namikas? Yes sensei, how was he able to fight one-on-one -on -one with Zabuza? Hess never shown that kind of power, not ever. Satsuki also questioned, part of her felt afraid that there was someone strong like him so close to her. Unlike Anko who Satsuki knew was loyal to and loved the village, she knew that Naruto didn't really have any friends at all in the entire village. He didn't have a reason to save or even care about her other than the obligation of being on the same team. But another part of her was relieved that her teammate was so strong, maybe he could help her become stronger too. Seeing the looks on her genin's faces, Anko made a muddled face as she admitted that she didn't know much about the blonde either you guess is as good as mine you too. From what I've noticed in the past month, he doesn't really have any friends in the village. 
I guess we can count since we kind of hang out and stuff, but other than that, nada. He also doesn't seem to really try during training sessions, we've all seen that. But today, I don't know why, but he was really fired up to fight against Zabuza. It's even more surprising that he managed to actually fight him one-on-one -on -one for a little bit. Anko said, explaining what Shes noticed so far. But she got confused looks from the students near the last part of her explanation. For a little bit, Anko sensei. But didn't it end in a draw? Yakumo asked, confused as she saw both of them look like they were about to drop, Naruto actually doing that. Satsuki shared her teammate's inquiry, she thought it ended in a draw too. Trust me you too, if that battle had dragged on, Naruto would've lost. And I do mean he managed to match him for a little bit. At the start of the battle, he was being underestimated by Zabuza, which is understandable coming from his position. But as soon as they started clashing, Zabuza started to get sharper in his movements, completely different from how he fought against me or Naruto earlier. That means that during the fight, he was removing the rust that had probably built up over the past few years, living as a new Pnin. Naruto on the other hand started to react a little bit faster each time, but Zabuza was recovering more of his old skills as a swordsman much quicker than Naruto was polishing his. That's why I said he managed to match him for a little bit. Anko explained to her students, seeing the looks of fear on their faces, she couldn't help but put her hands on the top of their heads and ruffle their hair. Don't worry you too, next time they'll take him on. I underestimated him like an rookie the first time because I thought his skills diminished over the years, which they didn't. Next time, he'll go all out. Anko reassured her students, which worked seeing the relieved looks and smiles on their faces. Now enough questions about him, he saved us didn't he? Why don't we go check on our favorite blondie? She said, standing up and heading to his room with Satsuki and Yukumo in tow. As they opened the door, they were met with a shirtless Naruto in the process of taking off his pants. They all froze, staring at each other. Satsuki's mind overloaded at the scene, she started stuttering and pointed at him as her mind tried to process the situation at hand. Her eyes turned into swirls as her face turned a vibrant red that put a tomato to shame. Her mind furiously imprinting the image of her teammate to her memory against her will. Ikumo didn't fare any better, her eyes were as wide as saucers as she stared at the scene. She tried to speak, opening and closing her mouth in an attempt to say anything. Her face a similar vibrant red to Satsukis. Her mind shut down at the image of her half-naked teammate, which unknown to her, was being burned to her memory. Anko just stared, being the oldest of the bunch, and having seen the male anatomy she didn't really react at all, though there was a very slight tinge of pink on her cheeks. The slightly erotic moment was immediately broken when Naruto removed his hands from his pants and walked to the door, his face blank. As he reached it, his face was still blank, but his cheeks gained a light dusting of pink as he said one word before slamming the door in their faces. Perverts. Dinner that night was a silent and awkward affair.